Hey, it's Alex from SeemsGoodMagic.com. Welcome to this week's episode of The Mortar Pod. Jake and I are talking about Rise of the Eldrazi this time around. If you didn't know already, on Magic Online, Rise of the Eldrazi is the current uh, draftable uh, non-standard set. Uh, Cube is also online, but uh, Jake and I have recently just been exploring uh, Rise of the Eldrazi, sort of getting a taste of it. We drafted it when it first came out, and it's been a long time, so... Uh, this podcast serves as a good refresher course for it. We, we uh, kind of run through a lot of the themes of Eldrazi and uh, the different uh, ways that you can go about drafting a deck. Um, there's multiple ways to do it. So uh, the, the deck we end up drafting at the end, we do a Rise of the Eldrazi draft at the end, and uh, the deck we end up getting is pretty interesting, so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I want to remind you that the Mortar Pod is brought to you by SeemsGoodMagic.com. Uh, Go to SeemsGoodMagic.com and you can check out uh, various articles, blogs, uh, my eBay store, all sorts of good stuff at SeemsGoodMagic.com. It's where I post all my draft videos. It's where we post these podcasts. So um, I really appreciate the community that's been coming out and supporting me. I want to uh, do more content for you guys. I'm doing as much as I can. Um, I really appreciate all the support you guys have shown. You can contact me at MortarPod at SeemsGoodMagic.com if you have any uh, questions or criticisms of the podcast or the draft videos, I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at SeemsGoodMagic, and uh, if you want to watch us live stream so you can communicate with us, uh, you know, split second, uh, we do it Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time, so I'd love to hear uh, more from you guys, love you to stop out. Just, uh, my, I mean, my ultimate goal is just building a larger magic community, so um, thanks again. Uh, this podcast is also also brought to you by VerenCamp.com, and that's V-E-H-R-E-N-K-A-M-P.com. Scott Verencamp created SeemsGoodMagic.com. I uh, always love to direct people to his portfolio so you can see some other work he's done. He's, uh, I mean, he's an excellent, excellent web designer. So uh, without further ado, enjoy this week's episode. Oh, uh, I also want to remind you, we talk about uh, Return to Ravnica block after Rise of the Eldrazi. Since it's sort of the wind down and the pre-release of M14 will be going on in about five days from when we recorded this podcast. Uh, so I think by the time this podcast launches, M14 will have dropped. So we kind of give uh, our final thoughts on Return to Ravnica and what we thought. So, uh, okay, enjoy this week's episode. All right. If you didn't know already, Rise of the Eldrazi is what's the additional set available online for drafting right now. Jake and I have only done one thus far, but uh, it was a good time. Fun. Yeah, we got all his dust first pick, which and uh, which was worth lot. 11 tickets. Yeah. That felt really good. Paid for that draft pretty much. Mm -hmm. And uh, the plan is at the end of this podcast, we're going to do another one. Um, so we kind of wanted to take this podcast to like talk about Rise of the Eldrazi, because that was a really cool set, mm -hmm. and it was really unique, and it was part of uh, it was part of the Zendikar block, but it was not it was drafted standalone. Mm -hmm. So when we draft it, it's just going to be triple Rise of the Eldrazi. And uh, Jake, maybe you know better why they had to do that. There was some mistake, right? They made some sort of mistake, or did they only? No, the, there was some mistake made. Oh, okay. So there was just, just Syndicar Roll Wake, and they had the Ally Cycle, but that was oh, their that, biggest... They, they admitted afterward that they should have continued the Ally thing because people were expecting it, even if they weren't in the traditional Ally form. So that was the mistake that they made, for sure, because people were like, so Ally's no longer here. You have Level Up now as like kind of the replacement for it who the heroes are supposed to be on the plane when they could have just as easily tacked ally onto every level up creature and not even had a have an ally reliant ability. You don't even probably know what if if you don't know what allies are, allies were creatures across spanning all the different colors, uh, from specifically Zendikar and World Wake that all had abilities that affected themselves and other allies. Um, and it ranged there I mean there were all sorts of allies we can even look through 
a few. Um, actually, I wonder if does magic cards that info search by creature type? Maybe not, huh? Oops. Doesn't look like it. It's just creatures with ally in the name. And uh, it's that's like okay. giving all I know the of ally too, <laughs> like rally and. But we can look at some of the allies, because this wasn't in Rise of the Eldrazi, and it was kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. It was a letdown, yeah. actually. It was, it was. This was another part of that whole, you leave the players feeling like they were let down. Yeah, know? I mean, it's literally in just all the colors. So, like, there were it ra abilities ranging from return a creature card with converted mana cost uh, less than or equal to the number of allies you control. There was one that was, like, gave them plus one, plus zero... Um, when this or any other ally enters, this one was yeah, specifically one was, part of a Naya aggro yeah. ally list. Uh, make them uh, discard cards, all sorts yeah, of stuff. Blackmail so blackmail for allies. That was a cool aspect of allies yeah, because no. it, it ranged from everything. It allies really, was very unique, like as far as uh, kind of the Lord type creatures go. Yeah, they were like they're almost comparable to slivers, but in a totally different vein. You know. Yeah. And how was it different than Slivers? That's actually... It was almost because it had... It, it always triggered on stuff, or... allies coming in. No, because there's Vastwood guy, that Animus, that makes an XX elemental equal to allies. And the mana production ally. They, and the clone I, I, ally. Ally just really ranged from everything. Yeah, it had like it was, every ability. It was cool because you would always have the creature rely on the number of allies you had, but it could be anything. It could be a whenever it enters or another ally enters trigger, or it could be tap, draw cards equal to the number of allies you control was mm -hmm. a really good one. Um, but the most common probably among the allies was the plus one, plus one counter ability. And there were some really sweet rare ones, yeah. too. There were, like, some of the rare ones were clone effect. This one actually was hard to play. Mm -hmm. But Kabir of Evangel was a three-mana one that gave, uh, whenever an ally entered, uh, you gave all your allies protection from the chosen color, so... Uh, I mean, obviously they weren't that great on their own. There were some exceptions to that rule, like Kazanu Blade Master, but um, they just it, it was full color range, full ability range. So that was very cool. Mm -hmm. And like I, I really like the allies. Got rid of it in Rise of the Eldrazi for no reason either. They really could have just thrown it onto anything, and it would have been fine. Yeah, a few creatures. If just they a couple. if they would have just put five. One for each color in there. No problem the, with that. Yeah. The thing about it is that allies actually just made even more sense once Rise of the Eldrazi was out, and they really should have been even more powerful allies. So that's why the level up guys could have just been called allies. You and, know? The, and the reason that Jake's saying that is we'll kind of give you the backstory to Rise of the Eldrazi. So it came out three years ago. I looked it up, so I'm sure. But uh, the unique aspect of Rise of the Eldrazi were the Eldrazi creatures, which were kind of like interdimensional weird beings that were colorless, and uh, they their their mechanic was Annihilator, which was a really sweet mechanic. Mm -hmm. And effects on being cast, which hadn't really been done on creatures that much up to that point. Um, until and they wanted it, that was one other way to separate them from other like real world creatures and also to make them feel like they were more in touch with the ether which is the stuff between planes all right interesting yeah. the eldrazi themselves like i said they were colorless creatures so they're not artifact creatures they're actually just a unique uh unique aspect in magic now the only colorless straight mm -hmm. up uh colorless non-artifact spells um i guess ghost fire was a colorless yeah it's just a first one that was done that was non-artifact colorless. Yeah, so I guess there was an exception to that rule even then. Mm -hmm. And that was a future site card. Um, so that's kind of cool that, that maybe that was like a, well, a segue it was, or a beginning it, stage. It could be a break. Yeah, a I think it was their branch into it, but yeah. it had been done traditionally in red before, like where red could become colorless. To get past damage prevention. Yeah, effects, maybe like which, creature activated abilities yeah, or something like that. that. Or like ghostly flame, which is all sources you control are colorless sources hmm. you know, of damage. So. Okay. Um, but the ability that they have is Annihilator. And Annihilator is Annihilator any number. Like in the case of uh, Artisan of Kozilek, he's a 9 mana, 10 9 Eldrazi. And the thing about most of the Eldrazi are they're enormous creatures. Huge, too. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> huge. The, 
<laughs> they actually had specifically seven mana or above was like the cutting off point for like the greatest of the Eldrazi um, lineage, and then everything below that was a drone, considered a drone, mm -hmm. or a spawn. So, Artisan's a 9-mana 10-9, and when you cast him, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and he has a Nihilator 2, which is whenever this creature attacks, defending player sacrifices two permanents. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's, I mean, that's super efficient, super strong. And uh, another unique thing about the Eldrazi was it's uh, whenever you cast. So instead of it, the creature having to enter the battlefield, yeah, to, to, is that what you just said? Just said oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so yeah, a unique but to aspect. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I missed that. Uh, Artisan and like Kozilek and like Ulamog, Imrakul. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that have when you cast ability. Those might be the only ones, but I guess we'll find out in a sec. Uh, the other creatures that sort of were a way to cast these creatures, because as you might imagine in Limited, it's pretty difficult to get to 8 or 9 usually. But this set had creatures like Dread Drone, which is a 5 mana, 4, 1, and he is also the Eldrazi creature type. Uh, when he enters the battlefield, put two zero one 1 colorless creature tokens onto the battlefield. And they have sacked this creature, uh, add 1 to your mana pool. So the Eldrazi spawn creatures, also colorless little creatures that double as, you know, chump blockers, as well as mana acceleration. So, uh, that was really the unique and mm -hmm. cool aspect about Rise of the Eldrazi was it was a format that was going to be slower and you generate big fat creatures. So it was really for what the, uh, the Timmy player, mm -hmm. he wanted the big fat, you know, um, they called it battleship magic or like, yeah, I think it was battleship. So you wanted your biggest guys out on the battlefield. I didn't. I never heard that. That was like what they were calling it in R and D or whatever. Okay. While they were developing. I see. Assignment. All right. Um, and there were cool Eldrazi auras, so they even expanded because there was also an Eldrazi instant spell, uh, not of this world. But Eldrazi mm -hmm. conscription was an aura that actually saw some constructed play, albeit in a really lame fashion mm -hmm. at the time. But it's an eight mana aura. Uh, it's a tribal enchantment too. Um, which is, I guess that is kind of unique. I thought they, when did they get rid of Tribal officially? Was it right it after, after the set? Or? set okay. yeah. They were just like, it's dumb because we did it. And then, they're, it's right to not have it. Because it was like, literally in that same block, Urge to Feed and Feast of Blood, two very vampire, in fact, straight up requires vampires yeah. or has additional effect for your vampire spells. And they, and weren't, they weren't tribal. tribal. Oh, I see. So you're saying because they were inconsistent, yeah. it didn't feel like it was right. It wasn't right. It would have been too much of a hassle yeah, for them to maintain. Everything would have to be tribal if it had to deal with that thing. And then, like, sometimes there'd be like, well, what about this one? You know, there's this gray area or whatever. And mm -hmm. if, if it had to deal with two different creature types, then it's like, well, what is it? Tribal, you know? I see. So just... The hassle of it, just mm -hmm. get rid of it. Okay. It's really more trouble than it's worth. But this one gave plus 10, plus 10, Trample, and Annihilator 2. Mm -hmm. So each time you'd attack with the creature enchanted with this, they'd have to sack two permanents. Pretty insane. Emrakul, of course, being the probably now most popular and famous creature from Rise of the Eldrassi. Yeah. Since he is the most powerful creature to have ever existed in Magic, he's a uh, 15... Colorless mana for a 15-15 legendary Eldrazi. Can't be countered when you cast him. Take an extra turn after this one. He is flying. He has protection from colored spells. And he annihilates for six. So when you read it, I mean, they certainly tacked enough abilities onto him. And it certainly doesn't seem overpowered because he has 15 mana. But, uh, I mean, of course, the ways to sort of... Yeah. Oh, sort of the protection they gave against uh, Rez is... Res decks is when he's put into a graveyard from anywhere, you have to shuffle him to the mm -hmm. library. Yeah. So they avoided that problem for the most part. There are exceptions to that, like Instant with speed, makeshift, mani yeah. makeshift mannequin. And actually, Which is particularly good with this mm -hmm. because it can't be then targeted once it's on the battlefield. But And the new one, Grim Return, would I guess be able to no, do it. No, I think if... it has to be put onto the into the graveyard. From... Oh, but yeah. Or wait, you wouldn't be able to target it because you do have to target it before it goes to the graveyard. No, it's not like Undying Evil. It's you t 
target a card in a graveyard that was put there from the battle. Oh, it, okay. It does do that? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. That's good. So you don't have to, like, target it before it goes to the mm -hmm. graveyard. If it's going to the graveyard. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, but Immercol used in the decks, like, Through the Breach, right? I think, mm -hmm. is that the name of the yep. card that's cheating it out from your hand or, or whatever? Or Sneak Attack or Show and Tell. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch uh, of yeah. different ways to get it out for free. But Decks designed to abuse Immercol in that fashion. And as you might imagine, it's pretty game-breaking. But they're... when it was in Standard, there was no problem. Yeah, I don't think so. Actually, there was a cool deck that ran it. It was mm -hmm. the Mono Green Ramp mm -hmm. deck. And uh, it was just a mono green. Like Overgrown Battlements, Draga Tree Speakers. And, and the deck like, actually worked. It yeah. was a good deck. Eldrazi Temples. And it looked fun. I never got a chance I think to play they did it. Avenger of Zendikar, too. Oh, yeah. For yeah. Sure. Definitely. Um, the Overgrown Battlements. Lore. Draga Tree Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. So they were just Omega Ramp. And uh, they would find stuff with the uh, Eye of Ugin. Mm -hmm. They could yep, even get the... And they could reduced, find a Wormcoil engine. It reduced... Well, that was eventually. Yeah, but like not it, in the beginning yeah, in stages, the beginning, but it was the like, final iteration of that deck was very good. Yeah, it definitely was. It was definitely competitive, and it was in a tough environment to be played, too. Mm -hmm. It was in a Cobblade environment, so it, yeah. it played well. Could keep up. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's more spawn producers like Immerkel's Hatcher. And there's actually, what's really cool is there's uh, common powerful Eldrazi creatures too. So Hand of Emrakul, pretty easily the worst one. And that's a 9-mana 7-7 seven, seven Eldrazi. And you can sack 4 Eldrazi spawn rather than pay his mana cost. And uh, he has Annihilator 1. Um, it That Betrays was cool. Kozlek is one of the, uh, what were they known as? The, the Titans, I think, or something. There was some unique title that they had, Kozlik Ulamog. Progenitors or something? I don't know. What I don't remember exactly the name of them, but what was cool is all three of them were had, they could not be res, so they were all shuffled back into the, the library if they would be, or when they're put into the graveyard. Um, but they all have an enormous Annihilator. Kozlik has four. I think Ulamog has what? He has... Ulamog's also four. I think... And, okay. Yeah, Emrakul's the biggest with six. Annihilator four is huge. Yeah. Um, but Annihilator six is out of control. Yeah. That's, you know, like, almost impossible to keep up with. And Ulamog's the craziest. Yeah, yeah. Ulamog lets you and destroy, not craziest, a, but just really destroy a permanent when yeah. it comes in. And then can't destroy him, and he annihilates for four. So yeah, it's that's like, true. He's, he's, he's a really tough thing to beat. And he's still legal and commander, right? Yeah. You just hate on people that play that, I'm sure. <laughs> A little too yeah, good. Yeah, Annihilator yeah. and Commander, as you might imagine. Extremely powerful. Very annoying. I just added Ulamog's Crusher, which is an 8 mana, 8-8, eight, eight, uh, Annihilator 2, must attack each turn creature uh, at common. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be a great limited card. Yeah. It's probably one of the better ones you can get at common because it's, it's actually good. at a reasonable yeah. cost. Everything about it is fine. Yeah. It's two more than Force of Nature, and it's like. A little better, you know. They, it's actually better. It it's is a, better. It's a phenomenal common. It's got to be up there as one of the most powerful. It's got to be like the most powerful common creature card in terms of power and toughness. I can't imagine another. I don't think so. I mean, Crash of Rhinos is an eight four. And that was a common. Yeah, that was a common. And uh, even Kinder Catch is like six six. Usually, it's like six power six, at common. Seven sometimes. You know, but, but eight is pretty special, I would yeah, think. Yeah, eight is pretty special. But there were all sorts of creatures like this. Not of this world was the tribal instant, Eldrazi instant, and that was seven mana counter target spell or ability that targets uh, permanent you control, and then it costs seven less to cast if it targets a spell or ability uh, that targets a creature control with power seven or greater. So this essentially affected all of the, you know, all of the big, uh, all the big Eldrazi. Uh, it wasn't a very good card. Definitely didn't see much play. But it was a cool concept, whatever. Mm -hmm. it's. They wanted to experiment in each uh, card type with Eldrazi and mm -hmm. see how the colorless spells went yeah. down. Like, it's fine as far as, like, an Eldrazi. It's something you can play in your Eldrazi commander, <laughs> like, deck, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those decks are annoying, though. It used to be Immerkul was legal in commander, and then they, they banned him. Yeah. For obvious reasons. As the commander, he was just... Well, the problem is that it goes into every commander deck, and then it's always a race to get your Emrakul online first. I mean, he's a little too game-ending. Yeah. Uh, taking the extra turn and then annihilating six, kind of brutal. I mean, the thing is, you do have to cast him to get the additional turn, 
So they at least were, you know, wise to that. Mm -hmm. But the card still, overall, are you still okay with with Immerkel, or, or I think, am. Okay. I think it is really powerful, but I'm okay with it overall. I think that they shouldn't give out the Chase Mythic as like a pre-release card, but they and then they say they're not going to do yeah, that anymore. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, Immerkel was given out if you uh, were got involved in one of the tournaments, the mm -hmm. Chase and, tournament. You said no, like Chase Mythic is what I said. Like Worm Coil Engine, a Johnny Vengeance, Emrakul, like. The, Those are all the really flagships good. of your set, but at the same time, they're, you know, definitely the money bear are they were the huge money yeah. cards too. I mean, they were they were definitely doing it for high turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, what how else to like persuade people to come? Mm -hmm. It was like that Grand Prix we did in Minneapolis. They yeah. gave out Chrome Mox, yeah, which was a great card. It was worth like fifty bucks, I think, when mm -hmm. I eventually sold mine or something like that. So mm -hmm. that was a great card to get. Um. So I recommend if you're looking to go out and you have a chance to go to a Grand Prix, you should because it's it's a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, there were a ton of ton of people at the one we went to. We went to actually we went to the Zendikar one, so that's kind of cool. And it was it had been the first time since uh, Kamigawa Block that there had been a Grand Prix in mm -hmm. that exact place or mm -hmm. in Minneapolis in general, maybe even Minnesota. I'm not sure. So I uh, think. yeah, I, I think it was just Zendikar and World Wake though. There was no. No, rise. it was just Zendikar. Just in the car. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, was that the one that also had the treasure card? Wait, what's that had the treasure card? Yeah, that was, that was in the car. Yeah. yeah. If you didn't know, like when Zendikar came out first, it was only the first few print runs, I the think. First right? print run. I it was think. only the first print run then, and uh, you had like a one in maybe a hundred booster chance or something. Something like that. It was. I think it was that rare. Yeah. To get like a special treasure card and treasure card. I never cards, opened one. I, yeah. I never got one. But treasure cards were uh, like old cards, like you would get mm -hmm. dual lands, and and they were in like pl like played to near mint condition, I think. Yeah, yeah, so they weren't giving you newly printed ones. Right. These were original printed ones. Yeah. yeah. But they they were willing to get like they were willing to buy these cards off of people in the like not so great condition, you know. And it actually it was fine, and it added to the flavor and feel of what they were going for which was you know this vast world of like hidden treasures you know that you can go find for yourself or mm -hmm. whatever it was and, cool yeah it was a cool idea it was really, exciting conceptually it was a really good idea and it like i think it all panned out in the end yeah too. people were excited mm -hmm. I, I remember being in the room when a couple people opened mm -hmm. it was exciting yeah, it is exciting uh i'm trying to think exactly what were all the cards like i, I don't think you were opening lotus maybe it was, it was power. power nine power nine was available in there i thought it, it was, was a lot of dual like, lands i thought yeah, it was there mostly were, dual there were lands. tons of dual lands i didn't hear much else besides i also heard about like Condo, candelabra Can, yeah i heard about candelabra but also library at alexandria i heard about that probably bizarre baghdad yeah, i would I think, think that it would be arabian nights like I well obviously antiquities too because there was Mishra's um Pat, workshop uh, yeah and then yeah and then all of the I want to say they they were willing to go up to unlimited but maybe they did revise too for the dual lands and stuff mm -hmm. but I feel like maybe they did do that you know maybe they went all the way up to revised well it's pretty cool yeah that they were willing to give out like power nine mm -hmm. as I part don't of think, a first print run. i don't think they went anywhere past antiquities as far as the expansions go though yeah so um, okay so anything from legends was our like already out yeah no, i'd love to read more on that i'd love to read more into that know exactly what was opened across because you want to hear about people opening yeah. black lotus it that was, would be like it was the, like the really dream. yeah it was like really chase cards for and it wasn't Format specific, but just in general, cool factor. So there were some that maybe weren't like the greatest ever printed cards, but I don't really think you had a chance of opening like Caracas. But maybe you got maybe there was Moat open. So because that yeah, one I could is, see that you know, too. That one makes sense, and maybe Caracas too. But I wonder what their minimum price tag was on what kind of treasure yeah. you open. I know because. There would have to be a price tag on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't feel like anything was less than like 50 bucks at least. Mm -hmm. um, like the cheapest dual land from, um, is it? Yeah, Plateau is the cheapest. And that's only like 35 bucks yeah. or something. So you can from get revise. And I, I bet that was, I bet all the dual lands were put in there. So that might have been like the cheapest card you could have gotten. Mm -hmm. It seems like. I don't I actually so. know how no, much I Candelabra think, are. I think it is 
that. But, that but I don't. But they didn't go. It, these were like the old sets, so I I think Legends was probably the late, last set that they would have taken stuff from to give to people, okay. and it would have probably only been the really great cards. Maybe a Eureka was in there or something like that, <laughs> but Moat for sure. I'm, okay. I'm sure that was in there. Uh, all right, let's get back on track to this uh, Eldrazi. Tim, both Jake and I did pretty terrible at that Zendikar Grand Prix, by the way. Yeah, but I had, a, I had a horrible deck. That's okay. Jake, I think you had a. Good I had deck. a really cool deck, but I I just like I get bored at big tournaments after like the fourth round. I'm just like, ugh, just let me go home, you know. Yeah, a lot of people can get burned out. Yeah, when I don't doing have like eight rounds. longevity when it comes to those big things. So it's a long day. Yeah, it's certainly a long day. And I was reading about the winner of the Las Vegas Grand Prix, um, and it was 17 rounds of magic. So that's like, I don't even... I wouldn't have done it. Like, I wouldn't have been able to do it. That actually just sounds absolutely, like... Painful. That, yeah. 17 rounds of magic. I can't even comprehend you know, but that, how long that would take. I mean, keep in mind that I also deal with magic day in and day out, like, every day of my life at the store and stuff too so like i get burnt burnt out on it really quickly when it comes to playing it so i'm sure people who have regular nine to five jobs can just go and grind it grind it i guess that might that's probably true but a lot of those guys are grinding it at home anyway on that's magic together online that's so, very true. Uh, they, maybe some people just are just, yeah some people can just grind games it's like the still the people that still play like uh wow after all these years mm -hmm. and like everquest you know um, all right, so Rise of the Eldrazi, what were some other themes from it? There was also the Defender theme. Maybe we want to talk about how exactly that went down. Um, so Rise of the Eldrazi had um, a Defender theme. So that means like there would be Defender cards with activated abilities that were affecting other Defender cards or... Uh, defender cards that were giving abilities to other defenders, yeah, basically stuff like cards that. that were reliant on defenders. An example would be Overgrown Battlement, which was one in a green zero four wall, and it had tap add a green to your manifold for each creature with defender you control. So the limited strategy that you could do, which was actually a cool strategy, was the Vent Sentinel strategy, and Vent Sentinel uh, was a four mana uh, two four elemental with defender, and it had one in a red tap. And it deals damage to target player uh, equal to creatures with defender control. The reason this card was cool is if you got it in multiples, it actually turned out to be a really quick engine mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you could that you could use. And two four was you know it's a pretty decent body for a defender. Yeah. So it survives. It it blocks well. It's cool a art. Good mana sink. Uh, did you ever get a chance to make the vent sentinel deck? I think I tried it. I'm sure it I tough. tried it because. I really wanted to do it, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it was very tough. I lost to it in uh, 2HG, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I saw that the the defender strategy was actually kind of a cool idea. That's a good idea, idea in 2HG, where yeah. you can give one person all of the defender cards, and then the other person plays the rest of the bowl, like mm -hmm. stuff. So then they can bust out mm -hmm. with, if you have like three Vent Sentinels in your pool or something, yeah, you really want to make that really work. Good. Yeah. And there were some other cool ones. Uh, do you remember Perimeter Captain? I actually really like Perimeter from Captain. World Wake, though. Oh, okay. But that was, oh, so there was also a little min, mini Defender theme within they World like, or or was it very they were very just small? touching it to bring it into Rise? Is like, Perimeter were, Captain like the only example, or um, maybe one other one? I'm sure there are other defenders. Like there's but the with, Ally like, Defender that generate abilities, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, oh, the shield bearer is yeah, the one you're talking about? I just don't know about any other defenders off the top of my head, but I'm sure there must be a couple more. Okay, well, this one it got definitely more yeah. serious. Like, Sourt Shield Bearer is a 2 mana 0 3 human soldier, and other creatures you control with defender. He's a defender too, yeah. but other creatures you control with defender get plus 0 plus 2. So, so two there's... of them out are 0 5. Yeah, so. good. Yeah. Wall of Omens, not uh, interacting with other. Uh, uh, defenders per se, but the fact that you get to draw a card off of it, it's two mana when it enters the battlefield, draw a card. What yeah. was it, the one in green called that was Wall like, of Blossoms. And that was like the original, yeah. of, or I guess the alternate of this. Mm -hmm. And this card just was so solid and good. And it's so strange as far as a white card goes too, but white card draw is usually pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, it's usually also attached to some benefit for your opponent or something yeah. like that or something else or some other stipulation to get it but the only other exception i can think of is that uh 
two and a white, uh, gain two life, and then if you have more life than yeah. your opponent draws, that's card. in this set too. Yeah, so survival, and what was that? survival cash. cash yeah. yeah. So that was a card that also was like white card draw. Mm -hmm. But you're right, usually there's something attached to it, mm -hmm. um, some sort of disadvantage. But this was just like a creature cantrip, I suppose. Was yeah, this way was played. I mean, it was like played probably yeah. right. Yeah, this was a great control card, obviously. Uh, blocker a, a blocker that replaces itself. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was at your mana leak mana. Yeah, but but if, they already had wait. they already had goblin um, guide down. So. True. And well, in turn four as well, it was like, you know what I mean? Yeah, turn four yeah. being able to wall plus leave up mana yeah, leak. That was always a good play. Uh, there's Battle Rampart, but this, I guess, affects all your creatures. What were some other cool... There were some that were... Battle Rampart's also a reprint, actually. Oh, that's interesting. Do you know what it was originally in? Mercadian Masks. It was the uh, first set with... A... Or no, it wasn't the first set with the wall theme, but... Legends was, was. Oh, Legends, Legends was, was the first, first set, set with a wall theme. theme. That's yeah. cool. But there was a, a pretty, like... Good like wall theme too. What did you think of Rage Nimbus yeah, at well. Rare? Rage Nimbus was a two and a red five three elemental defender flyer, and it was one and a red target creature I, attacks. I never liked level. it at Rare, I guess, but I see why. What it is like because it, you're eat, it, it can eat creatures. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty crazy card. It's a good card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool, and it's a weird. It's a very unusual defender mm -hmm. in red. Very unusual. It has flying, high power, it's efficiently costed, it's an odd defender. So, um, it's cool though. I guess a similar power toughness on a defender would be like Wall of Torches or something. Just the high power, low toughness mm -hmm. thing. Um, defenders with flying in red. Can you even think? Ether barrier, or membrane, ether membrane. That could, that was like it had reach. And yeah. I don't think that actually had flying. Or did it have No, flying? it didn't have flying. Okay, but, it but it, yeah, it had red reach. Mm -hmm. That's really weird, too. So, just really unusual red defenders. What was Torpid Morlock? I know it didn't have an ability like that, but... It was a 3-2 defender for one red. Um, You could sack three lands to make it... Lose defender able, yeah, until... Lose turn, defender or, and be able to attack, as though it didn't have it. That wasn't three defender, was it? No, that was after defender. Okay. Defender came out in Kamigawa. Oh, all right. Good to know. Mnemonic Wall was cool. It was sort of like the Archaeomancer of Rise of the Eldrazi. Mm -hmm. Very good in, in multiples with some of the removal in the set. Or like some of the rebound stuff. Because I think when you recast it out of exile, it goes to your graveyard then. So you could just play this and buy it again. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I like Oh, yeah, I like that a lot with rebound. So rebound was a mechanic from this set too. I guess we should go... Is that Are, are those the only mechanics, Annihilator and Rebound? In and Riser, rebound. Pretty sure those were all that were. In. And then there, well, there were a lot of cycles, but there weren't any uh, more mechanics. I don't think because mm -hmm. there was like the eight mana. Well, cycle I mean, creature. obviously level up too. Is oh yeah, mechanic. level up. No, absolutely, level up is a mechanic. I think. Yeah. So uh, I should show you some level up creatures. So that's sort of the defender theme, which was fun. Uh, let's do level up. We'll show you those creatures. They're cool. So level up creatures, uh, really intuitive. I really wish they. Yeah. I, I know it's complicated, but I, I wish they would have made it an evergreen ability. I think there's a chance they could bring this back in the next set. I would love to see this in a core set or there else. I mean, even like permanently. In, yeah. I really want this to be an evergreen ability, but let me describe what it is. So level up creatures are creatures that come in with a various uh, diverse costing level up cost associated with the the creature. So. We'll, we'll do Caravan Escort, for an example. It's a one-mana, one-one human knight, and it levels up for two colorless. Uh, at level one, so if you pay two mana at sorcery speed, uh, it goes to level from level zero, which it always starts at, to level one. At level one, it becomes a 2-2, two -two, and level one through four, it's still a 2-2. Two -two. But if you keep pumping the mana into it until it gets level five or plus, it becomes a 5-5 five -five first strike. So... Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just one example. It really gets out of control because you can do anything. You can give it. You can generate any amount of abilities once it reaches a certain level. I love this ability. It felt. It felt like playing Final Fantasy when mm -hmm. you think about it. It felt like all those classic RPG games you've played well, your whole life. You know, intuitive to Magic players because they're also the people who play Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy games and all the, and other RPGs. Mm -hmm. You're like leveling up. Training your character and you're and gaining more it abilities yeah, exactly. and you're getting stronger. Exactly. It, it just it made intuitive sense. I really loved this mechanic. 
I was uh, kind of sad to see it go, and I would love to see it return as an evergreen mechanic. I, I, I mean, I see the complexity of it because it's a unique window. You have to look at you have to look at a level up card to kind of truly appreciate how it's spaced out. I mean, they have multiple power and toughnesses on the front of it. I mean, it's, alternatively, you have like planeswalkers in Magic, you know, mm -hmm. as well that they really want to bring to the forefront of Magic and show to players and as like the thing to play and they're like really cool and fun and they have this like three different abilities kind of set up too so it's not totally out there as far as something to conceive when you look at it or whatever i guess you my know, I conceive, but the re the reason understand. i i guess what i was saying is the reason that i think they would have a hard time making this evergreen is it's uh it's a lot of ability it's a lot it's not just like a yeah. it's not a petty ability like a lot of the evergreen abilities, like trample and first strike. When I say evergreen, it's abilities that are that can be in any set. So you can just you can go anywhere, and you'll be able to you'll at least be able to see that mm -hmm. that like death touch is now. When did that? I mean, that became an evergreen mechanic After just a, a few world. years ago. Yeah. yeah. So just a few years ago, maybe like five or six years ago, that became one. So it's really like they've been incorporating new ones, and I could see this one having a hard time because it's really like. It's an ability that generates more abilities and, mm -hmm. and alters power and toughness. I mean, it's a semi-complex ability. It's in pretty complex, but once you see it, it's easy to grasp. I agree. It's an intuitive ability. I just wonder if they're hesitant to make it evergreen because it might. Um, I think it, it might overshadow yeah. like other mechanics. I think that's in the, the set. problem. Is that it once you yeah. make it evergreen, it it's like, well, why don't we make almost all of our creatures? level up creatures you know because then it'll seem weird when a creature doesn't have level yeah. up so I, I guess that's that's kind of the sad sad part about mm -hmm. level up it, it would be hard to incorporate but we'd love to see them be able to do that it would be a great mechanic to return to for sure yeah i'm because, at least okay with that yeah or, I, or even making the rule where it's like whenever you go to core set there's level up i wouldn't mind having level up available alongside um all the other like the blocks in a constructed environment mm -hmm. you know what i mean so that way you could always have it in core sets that would correspond with the, the block that's coming up. Yeah. It'd be cool if they just brought it back for like a core set or something like that too. I yeah, know, in general. Just to return to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just seeing it again would be really cool. But uh, level up creatures, very good in the set. And there's multiple cards associated with the level up ability too. Like uh, Venerated Teacher is a two and a blue, two, two. Um, I don't know. It's creature type, human something. Human wizard. And uh, it puts two level counters on each creature you control with yeah. level up. With level up, yeah. So, uh, you know, just makes them level twice. Mm -hmm. It's a cool, flavorful card. Difficult like to play. Lot, Obviously yeah. difficult to play as a blue-gray ogre otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, what else is associated with it? Time, Time of, of Heroes, Heroes was like a uh, Honor Champions of the Pure, too. you know, sort of uh, ability or blessing type ability. Mm -hmm. That was uh, if you if your creatures had two or more level counters no, on them. Just as one. long as they had... As, each creature you control with a level up counter on it gets plus two, plus two, I believe. I guess we do have Gatherer. Yeah, so Time of Heroes was a, uh, yeah, two mana, each creature you control, level counter on it gets plus two, plus two. And it's a cool picture, too. It is a cool picture. So ready to charge Emrakul, presumably, or just mm -hmm. a big Eldrazi? Well, it looks a lot like Emrakul, but it could just be one of the spawn of Emrakul or whatever. Were there any other cards that affected level creatures you control? Champion Strike also. Oh yeah, that. Champion Strike was a cool one. So that was uh, a 2 mana 1-1 one, one, uh, blue drake with flying and it gets plus 3 plus 3 as long as you control a creature with 3 or more level counters on it. Actually the draft we did uh, we streamed it so you can watch it at you know twitch.tv slash Inez27 and uh, it keeps a little bit of the history but if you want to watch the last Rise of the Eldrazi draft deck that we uh, made. Uh, we had like two champions drakes and maybe like seven or eight level up yeah. creatures. So that's kind of cool. I mean you could you can pick up a lot of level up creatures. Like I said, there's there's quite a few actually. And they also are in all colors. Um, a lot of them are really fun and powerful. Yeah. They made some cool rare ones. They yeah, made like a the, Merfolk Lord. The fact that it's all over in every color was another reason I thought they could have just tacked ally onto these guys and called it good, you know. Mm -hmm. Not even giving a shit about mentioning the fact that they were allies. Yeah, you're right. So they could have been level up creatures with ally. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That would have been cool. And then that would have been like 
the culmination of how they came together and became powerful. Yeah. Started able to gain levels. You're right. Train together and stuff. Yeah. Fight together. Cargan Dragon Lord. He was definitely a red deck wins one. He was a two mana two two mythic. Um, and he'd level up for one red. And if you got him to level four, he became a four four flyer. And if you got him to level eight or plus, he was an eight eight flying trampler. And he had red. He had fire breathing. Really strong. Mm -hmm. Really strong. He was really strong, and especially at level eight. Mm-hmm. Because I knew Tusk Collar. This one's kind of painful, bittersweet to look at. <laughs> we just lost to it, actually. Um, round one of the last... The the only Rise of the Eldrazi draft we've done and recorded online so far. Um, yeah, it's pretty annoying. It's a two-mana 1-1 one, one Shaman. Has a level up for two. And at level two, you can tap it and put three three green elephant creature tokens into, onto the battlefield. And then at level six, you get two green elephants, so... Unfortunately, we didn't. Our deck didn't really have. Well, we had some spot removal, just not a lot or enough. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is a rare one too, so you usually don't expect to see it. The deck we lost against was absolutely insane. We were talking about earlier how many rares were in the deck. It was a green red deck that had seven rares that we knew of. Yeah. In it, and Immerkel was in his deck. Mm -hmm. It was a really stupid deck he had. It was very good. So the level up uh, something to keep in mind when you're if you're going to draft this set. Very powerful mechanic. Uh, what was the other mechanic we want to look at? Rebound. You need to look at Rebound. Mm -hmm. Rebound's a good one. It's a cool one. I'm trying to think of all the cards. Yeah, it looks like a lot of them actually saw a play in at least a fringe deck. Mm -hmm. uh, Distortion Strike. Uh, well, let me read what Rebound is. Rebound is, if you cast a spell from your hand, exile it as it resolves. At the beginning of your next upkeep, you may cast this card from exile without paying its mana cost. So it was an ability you had to remember to do before you drew, or you'd miss it. It would remain permanently exiled. Mm -hmm. uh, but what were your feelings about Rebound? Um, I liked it. it. It's a cool ability. It's So it's pretty much restricted to instants and sorceries. But uh, getting, I mean, getting the ability twice it seems pretty simple. It doesn't seem like it would be, you know something that's creative enough for the game, maybe. Because it is pretty narrow, what yeah. it's actually doing. It's just cast the spell twice, mm -hmm. essentially, or, or in two turns. Yeah, you know what I mean? over the so, course of two turns. But it, simplistic as it was, it was a good mechanic. It was strong. There were pl I'm trying to think of the best spells. Um, Stagger Shock was probably the best one. Yeah, I'm actually really surprised they didn't do just draw a card. Like, First as cash. a blue... No, like as a blue instant or something. Blue Instead of uh, can't well, be blocked. No, Distortion Strike's fine, but in addition to that, I'm surprised they didn't oh, okay. do, like, draw a card. Oh, well, I guess Recurring Insight lets you draw it. The myth, or the rare one. Yeah. And Cast Through Time was the mythic one. That's actually interesting. So they did make it a mostly blue mechanic. Well. It kind of makes sense. They made the, like, And I guess. No, they didn't make it mostly anything. Oh, okay. But they gave they, the mythic to blue. That's what I was, I guess that's what I was thinking. So they, it gets a rare and a mythic, and the other one's... Only get one rare, maybe? Green only gets one uncommon. I think this was spread based on how the colors like spells. Yeah. You know, blue... Blue definitely likes instant and sorcery yeah, the most. So it so. gets yeah. the heavy-hitting rare. And, and, and red, would, really good red, would, red would definitely get it, too, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a burn color. Yeah, so it got Stagger Shock, which was highly played, I think. Yeah, it was two and a red instant. Deals two damage to creature or player with rebound, so... I I played it. it. It's phenomenal in Popper too. Yeah. It's a great Popper card. I mean, getting two damage over the course of two turns, so nuking for four for three mana at common, mm. really strong. Yeah. Really good and limited too. Yeah, it was. It was very good and limited. Virulent Swipe was really good and limited for that same reason. Um, you could. The cool thing about uh, targeted rebound spells was you could counter it if you could take care of the target that it was mm -hmm. tar targeting. So, like, you, you try to stack the re rebound by removing the target. Yep. So, if you stagger shock a creature, and they sacked it in response, and or got, you know, got rid of it in some way, put it into the battlefield, or put it into the graveyard, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to rebound it. It would just go to your graveyard. Mm -hmm. It does specifically say you have to exile it as it resolves, and it also specifically says you have to cast a spell from your hand. Maybe that seems irrelevant to you, but there was a time when Stagger Shock and Bloodbraid Elf were in standard together, and actually, if you Bloodbraid, which has Cascade, which is casts uh, or reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a spell with converted mana cost 
less than uh, this card's converted mana cost, and then you may cast it uh, without paying its mana cost. But because Dagger's Rock has to be cast from your hand, it wouldn't rebound either if you cascade it into mm -hmm. it. So I kind of found that out the hard well, way. Well, the other way, or the other reason is it just would keep looping itself if you cast it. Yeah, because exile. that's yeah, that's true. So the wording would have had to have been different anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, survival Cash was the white one we were talking about earlier where you gain two life and then if you have more life than an opponent, draw a card. It was a really weird card. I feel like it's probably limited playable. Um, but it I is could, a weird card. But I could see it being... Also a sorcery. Everything about it is kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. White card draw. But like we said, this and there's another white card, so it's kind of weird that white got card draw in this set. Um, you know, I wonder if there's a reason for that, if it was just sort of experimentation. or. I think it might have just been experimenting, but I don't like white having card draw. It doesn't make sense. White is already... It feels really good. Because it's so good alongside blue, which is the best card draw. Yeah, but it feels good alongside a lot of colors. I feel like. White and green and white and red. I mean, aggressive decks don't need to be able to draw extra cards either, you know, if all they're planning to do is kill you on turn four or five. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I could see, and like we said, like Survival Cash could be just completely worthless mm -hmm. at that point then. If there's any sort of aggro strategy yeah, against yeah. you, you're just in bad shape, that's a good point. Then you're worried, you're just gaining four life. Yeah. Over the course of two turns. But this has like a better than divination, sort of. Getting two cards in four life would be really good. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so Consuming I, I, Vapors was really good. Actually, I feel like the disparity on this card is the big problem with it. It's either really bad or really, really good. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In limited. Or, constr yeah. or constructed. More limited. I feel like against a control player, it's good in constructed. You know? Because you will probably have the same or life when you cast it, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't so, know. So, better in the control match, I can yeah. see that. But it was never really played. No. Uh, World at War was a pretty insane one, since it gave you uh, the Relentless Assault ability. It was Boys in red. Yeah. yeah, so it gave you an additional attack phase. And then the next yeah, turn. Yeah, five mana is pretty cheap, too, actually. I yeah, think. Relentless I Assault was, was, was the same cost, wasn't no, it? No, Relentless is four, but oh, okay. five is pretty cheap for getting it twice. I guess it still does require you to have a Fun, army yeah. army that matters. No way the assembly was a uh, interesting one, but felt uh, I don't know. I, I don't think it really saw that much play. It was it yeah. was like if you're getting more and more tokens doesn't really. I, it's cool with itself. It yeah. puts one one white core soldier creature tokens on the battlefield for each creature you control, so it literally can do nothing at six mm -hmm. mana, which I, at rare it's not very good. Yeah, I and feel I, like it should have been. Uh, Put two out and then put one out maybe for each one you control. Yeah, but then it might have been really good. At six, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but the problem with it was it could do nothing at six. It did have rebound and it was cool. The reason it's cool with itself, obviously, is if you have like four creatures, you get four more and then the next turn you get eight. Mm -hmm. So it could like overwhelm, but definitely didn't see much constructed play. And since it was rare, be tough to get yeah. it unlimited, well, and you'd have to have the right deck for Conqueror's it. Conqueror's Pledge was in standard with this, and it guaranteed you six creatures. The reason this is actually better in limited is because this is uh, Eldrazi spawn token mm -hmm. uh, set, so you'd or have defenders. A, yeah, so you'd have a bunch of either zero one uh, spawns, you know, which are generated by a creature. So really, there's a lot of creatures in the set that are essentially three creatures mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. which is really good with no yeah. assembly. So I can see that being better in limited. Recurring Insight, like you said, this is a card that's definitely commander playable. Six mana sorcery, draw cards equal to the number of cards in target opponent's hand, and it's got rebound. And then Cast Through Time is a seven mana mythic one. Instant sorcery spells you control have rebound. So these two, rare and mythic, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a lot of card advantage gained by that. You've probably played Cast Through Time and Commander as well, right? Yeah. Pretty obnoxious. It's cool. It looks insane. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not the same as Omniscience. I really hate that card in Commander. I'm glad I haven't go, had to... Have you had to go up against it? I've, I've played with it and been frustrated <laughs> after I played with it because it was just like, well, I guess I win. You know, it's like, I 
you have card draw alongside it, and then all of a sudden yeah. it's just like... It's like, oh, it's over. It's way too broken. Yeah. yeah. And then it's just draw, 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 draw. Yeah. yeah. Omniscience did seem like it was kind of an, uh, an annoying concept. And I, to me, it's just like the most no-brain design in the whole world. Like, big, expensive, stupid thing that lets me cast everything for free. Do yeah. You know? It never really broke into a constructed standard, but it does feel obnoxious and commander. It's just like, you don't even have to do anything except for pay a ton of mana. You know? Like, there's no work involved. You just get to cast stuff for free. And you can cheat it out. Yeah. We had talked about how it was possible to cheat it out alongside uh, Obzidat's Aid, which is the new card from Dragon's Maze. And uh, it's a five mana return player permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So obviously some setup there. you got to get Omniscience in your graveyard and then yeah, have this but... card to res it back. And it's in weird colors. But I guess the whole point that you can even cheat that card, that is sort of the difficulty with either... Making cards that cheat in spells, it limits, like, expensive spells. You know what I mean? They almost, like, it limits the power level of expensive spells when you make cards that are capable of cheating out mm -hmm. more expensive spells. Like res cards. That's why they're so um, sensitive about how they sort of design them now. They have to be, like, four mana or five mana. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of the new... Grim Return, three mana, but it has to only be, yeah only things that have actually died, not things that are just put into your graveyard. Yeah, and yeah, and specifically that turn, so yeah. much more narrow. I mean, if you think about it, if you look at Reanimate, if you don't know that spell, I mean, this is an old school one that was a one mana put target creature card from a grave. I mean, that this is obviously was designed in a different era of Magic. Well, look at Corpse Dance. <laughs> Corpse Dance. Let's look at this one. Three mana. And it's got buyback, and it returns the top creature card of your graveyard to the battlefield. So this one, if you don't even remember this, it used to be you'd have to uh, be aware of the order of your graveyard, mm -hmm. which is not something that they do anymore. That was an awkward. That was an awkward phase of Magic, I think. Yeah. But return the top. I bet that caused a lot of like arguments and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Did you choose how you? How did you choose? Yes, you choose the. If, if, of your graveyard, if, if it's simultaneously, yeah. if things simultaneously die, you choose the order of the graveyard. So that is kind of cool. But yeah, this, I mean, top creature card of your graveyard to the battlefield, are you kidding me? It's way too, like, ugly. It is way ugly, too ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly it what ugly. it is. Yeah. But uh, Dance of the Dead was an old one. Old fave of mine. I love this card. It was a two mana. And, oh, it has to have the same wording as Animate Dead. That's too bad. But uh, Dance of the Dead was a two mana res spell. Enchant Dead Creature. Beautiful wording on that original. <laughs> but then when it comes back, it's alive, so... Enchant dead creature. I would love to see... It's not dead anymore. It's not dead anymore. Is it on the battlefield? <laughs> no, it's not dead, so put it back in there. Uh, it comes in tapped with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Or no, it just tapped yes. with plus one and has plus one. And doesn't untap during its controllers and taps up. And you only have to pay one or black to untap wow, it. Wow, look so. at all of these abilities. It's not even a... It's Yeah, it actually does have This a one's, like, more ugly than an anime dead, in my opinion. So many... Ugh. So ugly. This would be, like, impossible to reprint with that wording. Yeah. That is so much text that... It's it's like an unglued card. <laughs> it's so mm -hmm. much text. Uh, and there was also, of course, the most famous being anime dead. Because it was an alpha card. You can look at the alpha version. Always love the original text. Any creature in either player's graveyards comes into play on your side with minus one to its original power. So ugly. If this enchantment is removed, or at end of game, that's our favorite part. Yeah, that is my It favorite. had to remind you that at end of the game, you had to give the creature back. Yeah, but I stole your guy. No, I took I it. No, 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 you don't, you don't quite understand. I animated dead, so it's on my... So I own it. <laughs> so I, I actually own it. Own it. And actually, there, <laughs> as funny as that concept is, we had to, we kind of looked. I mean, we have to know the history of the game where it was originally an anti game, yeah. so that there could actually come that argument because it's like I don't know, man. Yeah. It's an anti game. I took it. Yeah, it is really funny that even in alpha, they knew that that could come up as a problem, so they did this. You know. Yeah. So animate dead also a very good res spell. Uh, so those are kind of the classic examples of res that they cannot do anymore. I mean, these cards are legacy playable. They're so good. Probably even vintage. I don't know. I, I God knows what happens in vintage. I, I don't know the first thing about that. Those, those tournaments, you really want to watch for vintage because that's going to be the most obscure format at a certain point because it really involves cards that have been out of print for 20 plus years. 
So, you know, or I guess not 20 years, but close to 20 years now, mm -hmm. 18 years or something insane like that. Cards. Oh, at least 15 years. So as we get older, it's not like we're going to get more copies of these cards unless they reprint them or something does an Omega overhaul to vintage, which seems unlikely. It'd be hard. It, I don't know if they'd ever power creep to the level that they power crept with power nine cards. You know what I yeah. mean? Those were just, those still represent some of the most powerful effects in magic. Well, just one the, mana instant just mox, draw three cards. Just the Moxes <laughs> and Lotus alone are all like effects that they can't do anymore unless they have, but they keep trying to get very close to it and make it with free justified. cards. They yeah. still do free cards. Like Lotus Bloom is, in my opinion, the best example of them fixing a power nine card, you know. Mm -hmm. And even like, I suppose Mox Diamond is probably. Because it still has a requirement. Yeah, it's probably the best as far as the um, moxes go that they've are, that they've redone. Yeah, like Chrome and, Mox, I, I mean this is step, definitely still played in like. I don't like Chrome Mox personally. Um, I see the value of it. I don't like it, but the, I I like Mox Opal, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's a legendary, you know, card. I think that Mox Diamond is probably the best because it makes you trade the resource that you're trying to get for that resource so next turn you might not be able to play the land but you got it this turn you know that's yeah. why i like mox diamond yeah no that's a good point you did have to get rid of another resource mm -hmm. so but it was still it could still be insane mm -hmm. it, was, it was definitely still legacy playable i don't even know do you think they could bring something like that back again or... mox diamond i i think it's probably I'm out still, of their realm i'm still uncomfortable with it. i think that they are too i think that they like it as legendary also and it makes sense as legendary, all of them actually make sense as legendary because they are opinion. because they are essentially they're free so yeah, yeah they're so strong and back then when they first came out and stuff and you could have more than four of them in your deck or whatever mm -hmm. you why if you could and before the game took off if you could why would you even play lands like why wouldn't you just play moxes all moxes all the moxes because then you could play everything in your hand on the first turn presumably yeah you know? and we were ruining chandelier too <laughs> yeah was, i mean they let you do that in yeah that and chandelier was really cool i really like chandelier but it showed you how stupid the game used to be too even with like the vast majority of the cards being shitty if you got the good ones if you're unfamiliar with chandelier it was an old it was like the original um, Magic Online. Yeah, it kind of was. I mean, not really, I guess you're right, since it was... Well, what's more amazing, it was in versus NPC. Yeah. So if you looked at, like, the graphics, obviously a little bit dated, but, uh, I mean, it's an old game. Um, a fun fact about this set is that it originally was... Uh, I mean, it was made by uh, Sid Meier, who also made Civilization oh. games. I don't know if you knew no, that. I didn't know that. Isn't that cool? That is cool. It's really cool. And the Civilization... I mean, the Civilization games have obviously taken off. They were very... I don't know if there's... They're obviously not at their like peak popularity, but mm -hmm. when I was a kid growing up, Civilization was an amazing game. I mm -hmm. loved that game. It was a really cool idea. I remember a lot of people. It was kid game. friendly, so it was yeah. really like a game that parents didn't mind buying for their kids because mm -hmm. it almost gave you like history lessons mm -hmm. in it, you know. But it was still really fun because you got to build an army and like take yeah, over yeah. take over cities and stuff. But Chandelier was a game where you built. It was really cool. You actually like started with you chose a color and then they gave you a free deck that wasn't even completely that color. It was like all. Well, <laughs> It depended on the difficulty. It, yeah, it depended on you. If you chose the, the hardest difficulty, the hardest difficulty, it was the most random assortment of cards in your starting deck. And if the easier you chose your difficulty, then the more consistent your assortment was. Mm -hmm. So if you chose the easiest setting, then you could have a very like good deck to start with. You know. Not, and what did this go up to? It just was like revised, right? I think. Uh, no, it was fourth edition. Okay. It was it was fourth edition base, and then they they went and took all the, like the most pop powerful effects from older sets and put them in as well. What's but, what's sweet about this game is every game was an anti game, mm -hmm. and it was always versus the computer. Yeah, and so you got to play with the cool old school cards that uh, played for uh, anti too. Yeah. Like contract and blow, I uh -huh. love that card. I always did. Contract yeah, that card blow. is crazy. <laughs> that card is so nuts. We gotta look up. I wanted to look up the exact wording on it, but contract from below, such a phenomenal card. Uh, if you're playing anti, of course, mm -hmm. one mana, discard your current hand and draw eight new cards. It was eight. I didn't even realize yeah. that. Well, no, it's seven. 
except the first one you draw is for anti. Oh, adding the... Oh, I see. This yeah. is like the old school yeah. wording on it. I'd love to see the alpha. Discard your current hand, draw eight new cards, adding the first draw into your anti. Remove this card from your deck before playing a Canal Flame Grand. No, no difference. One, one black, draw eight. Yeah. Or we'll draw seven, essentially. Hand. But that's insane. Yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> one row. And also the Moxes and Black Lotus were in Chandler. But we, d I, I want to give uh, Sid Meier all the credit in the world because the I felt like, even though there were definite definite glitches and problems occasionally with the battle system, for how complex of a game Magic is, and like considering this was well before they had done well, anything with Magic like, Online, they had interrupts still at this time too, so there was even an added element to the game that is different than it is now with instants yeah. and interrupts. Yeah, and the game was actually really difficult, mm -hmm. I felt like. Oh, yeah, did we mention uh, the the old-school mulligan rules? Mm -hmm. So the old-school mulligan rules were if you had land in your hand, you couldn't mulligan. Yeah. How ridiculous is that? Yeah, or vice versa. Like, or you could only mulligan if you had all or no lands. That was the mulligan Yeah, rule. so it was just all or no lands. But if you had, like, one land with, like, all your five drops, oh, you got to keep it. Yeah. Good How luck. terrible is that? So. Yeah. The game actually, I felt like, was really difficult because there was such a crazy random aspect to it. But you could save your game, so mm -hmm. it's not like they made it super hardcore. Yeah, and you would you just have you would want to save your patient. game a lot if because if you lost some of your good cards, it was like no. Yeah, but you could to get insane stuff. Like anti. I had like a black lotus once, and you could randomly run across these guys that randomly just double a card. Yeah, you control. In your deck. So yeah. I had double black lotus before, yeah. and then it's like yep. just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the end, the deck I would make would just be Atogs, Mox, and Moxes, and Lotuses. So it was just turn one, you get your turn one Atog, and then you just swing for like 12 on turn mm -hmm. two or whatever. But the guys you would fight against, I'm sure the boss of the game, I never even got to it, would be really difficult. Like, you wouldn't start with 20 life either. No, it was weird. It was based on how many, like, cities you had, like, no, I didn't realize yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah. How that many how towns much or you cities you had a mana link with, that was how much life you had in each game. That's really and interesting. And then they would, like, they had a sorcerer that was, like, one of each of the five colors, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would send their minions to attack the cities that you had mana links with and rob you of life than if they controlled those cities instead. Yeah, that was even more yeah. difficult. So it was like you had to constantly be, the higher your life total gets, the more you have to be protecting the cities that you have, like, control, control of. of. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be all over the map, and it's really hard because you have to walk everywhere. There's no, like, special just free warp button. No. Um, and you're you, constantly getting run down. Yeah, Like, some exactly. of the guys are way faster than you. Yeah, and you want to, like, you pay them off with gold. It's very <laughs> difficult. It like, was. And you have to go in dungeons, mm -hmm. and, like, you can't it's even dungeons. leave the dungeon. Yeah. You, you if, only... you leave the, if you leave a dungeon, they, it like, never respawn. returns. It doesn't respond. Oh, it's just gone. Yeah, okay. it's gone forever. So, and they, but there's like always a loot card yeah. that oh, you there's can like get up to three loot cards. Yeah, and they, and they're trying to be powerful. Yeah, like oh, they cards. are the powerful loot cards. That's how you get the most powerful spells mm -hmm. in the game. So it was a cool concept. The design was was good for its time. I mean, mm -hmm. what are we talking? Early nineties and yeah, it was really ninety three. I bet the game came out in probably ninety six or something like that. Yeah, probably ninety five, ninety six. It had to have been before fifth edition. So. It, yeah, it was ninety six probably at at the latest. Yeah, it was a it was a lot of fun though. I very much very much enjoy Channel R. I revisit it from time to time. Mm -hmm. Briefly, it does get frustrating. It does get very frustrating. Um, so we named all the rebound cards. We named all the level up cards. Named the Eldrazi cards. Maybe we want to talk a little bit more about the strategies that we know of. Like we should look at the instants and removals just for our own benefit too. And we can tell you, I can tell you what cards I thought were the most powerful instant and sorcery in terms of removal or buff spells in Rise of the Eldrazi. Uh, like, what you have to do with this set is really be conscious of the fact that it's a slower format, which means cards that may, you know, that would appear to be, like, really good in Return to Ravnica block, for example, may not be very good in Rise of the Eldrazi. So, you might see a lot of cards that your stand out in your mind is like, wait, that's way too good to have, but it's actually like not good at all. Mm -hmm. Like Flame Slash, for example, I can show you that one. Flame Slash is a one mana sorcery in red that uh, deals four damage to a creature. I feel like if you had that in a court, can you imagine having that in a core set mm -hmm. or something like that at common? Yeah, probably not at common. Uh, too good, yeah. but 
common in this set is no problem because like we said you're having you have a lot of eight apes that you're you know it at least takes turn like six before you can cast them and that's only if you have the ramp of some sort mm -hmm. and a lot of times you're generating like an army of zero one so flame slash doesn't look too good uh let's just look through the instance real quick and uh We'll tell you the good ones. So Aura Finesse, not that good. What's what's Emergence Gaze, I could see being pretty playable and limited. It's I cool. Yeah. It's a cool like save my guy this turn and then get in unopposed next turn. So it's a it's a Effect. one it's a one mana instant and creature control tart creature control gangs protect from the color of your choice until in turn with rebound. Very good. Fleeting distraction, uh probably decent. It's at least playable yeah. since it nets you a card for one mana. So not that terrible. Uh, it's just a one mana target creature gets minus one minus zero draw a card. Heat ray, actually a good card, even though you know it would cost quite a bit of mana you to kill one of your fat a lot of mana, Yeah, you could also generate a lot of mana, but even though it's expensive, um, you know, to kill Eldrazi with it, it was very good for the cheaper, the level up creatures. It's just mm -hmm. a nice efficient way at instant speed. It's just a red and X instant deals X damage to target creature. So it's like an instant speed fireball, but it can only target creatures. Mm -hmm. It's no care of X torch. No. That it is not. Uh, wishes it was, though. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, let's see. Lee Pharaoh. That's probably... Uh, that guy played against us, though, I guess. Game two. Yeah. In the one game we did. It, yeah. yeah. So not really a main deckable spell, but it's just one green. Deals three damage to a creature with flying. at Kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. Mighty the Masses. What do you think of this one? I actually really like this card alongside a heavy Eldrazi spawn token deck. Then I could yes, see it. Then yeah. I could see it being good. That's mm -hmm. sort of the application of it. It's a one mana instant in green. Tar creature gets plus one plus one for each creature you control. Decent. Praise vengeance. The other, the only green from what we saw, the only yeah. green rebound spell, and it's tar creature gets plus two plus two. Well, what other rebound spell would you do in green, really? You know. Yeah, like a fight they could do now. This is pre. -fight. They could do fight. They, now. they could have if that had been around. But even fight is, like, that's really really good. You know, targeted removal twice. Mm -hmm. Still uh, contingent on you having a good Good enough draw, creature, yeah. a good enough creature too. Uh, Smite. This is the first. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I deal with my cat for a second there. Uh, Smite one white. Destroy target blocked creature. We see that and uh, came back and gate crash. Mm -hmm. Was a phenomenal limited card. They really like this card for so that. Happy. Yeah, I and, like this card too. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, obviously amazing in this format since you're dealing with 8-8. Eight, eight. Uh, actually, I really like the place of this just because you still are punished by the Annihilator aspect. Yeah. So it's not like you're you getting... You got a... out empty hand. No. Or got out scot-free or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Eldrazi player is still getting you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Even Annihilator 2 was an annoying big deal. Annihilator you know? 1 is good, too. Yeah, so, so all of it was good. Yeah. Annihilator in general is a mechanic that I thought was really powerful, well, and it was if, a great it was a great flavorful way to represent these extremely strong interdimensional mm -hmm. beings. Distro like ransacking a planet, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's since it it's is it just sacrifice? It's just sacrifice. Yeah. I guess it would have been cooler if it was like exile. Then it would have been yeah. like more of a like devour into eternity sort of thing. Yeah, yeah it where it, it's yeah. like making it a race from existence mm -hmm. or something or into a different dimension. Yeah, but they're like literally destroying and smashing and just rending asunder. Not necessarily like portaling everything out of existence. I see. So there's wreaking destruction. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Uh, Vendetta, one black. This is actually another reprint from Mercadian Mess. Wait, this is the second one we've seen from Mercadian Mess, right? Battle yeah, Rampart so, yeah. as well? Interesting. It is interesting. Do you think that was because Mercadian Mass also had a Defender theme, and maybe that? It probably like Mercadian Mass Defender theme was like small, very small, but it was there. Okay. Um, Interacting with yeah. each other at least. Okay. Uh, Vendetta for one black is instant destroy target non-black creature can't be regenerated lose life equal to that creature's toughness. Cool like double-edged sword. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Where it's like. Yeah, I'll kill your Eldrazi, but I'm still getting punished pretty bad for it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're paying a one mana removal spell. So, how would, what are your feelings about Vendetta? It was always good against level up guys, you know. Yeah, that's true. Especially if they were just about to invest the mana to mm -hmm. get to the next. It was always best to do it right before they were going to get to the important level. Mm -hmm. And be like, oh, okay. In yeah. Response. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> in response to the, the level counter. And then sorcery speed, so they can't do it in response to that. Yeah. 
So Vendetta, you're right. Excellent out for level up. It's uh, actually less good against Eldrazi, but it still kills them fine enough. Virulent swipe. Cool one. That one was a good way to handle Eldrazi, too. Yeah, good point. I do one... like that Like a lot of the rebound cards actually are just good ways around Eldrazi, it seems like. Was there a bounce? Was there a bounce one too, or no? It was consuming vapors. Was the sacrifice one? Your opponent or target player sacks a creature, and you gain life equal to its toughness for mm -hmm. four mana, and rebound. That Wait, which really the good. surreal memoir? Is that what you said? No, or... consuming vapors. Oh, the rare one. Yeah, mm -hmm. God, that one was good. Yeah, I played that in constructed too for a little while. There were some like mid range decks I remember at the time that really liked that card a lot. Mm -hmm. It could really take you apart. It was good against my. Uh, Believe it or not, it was good against that haste deck. I had like a really hasty blood break mm -hmm. ball lightning deck for a while. It was good against that. Yeah. Even if it was a little bit slow for a mid rangey deck, it might have been enough to turn the tides. Well, the life gain was what was yeah. really good about it. Well, alongside Nighthawk, too. Yeah. I mean, there was a yeah. lot of good outs at that time. And that was like the first appearance of Vampire Nighthawk, mm -hmm. which was cool that they brought it into M13, I thought, too. Yeah. I actually thought that was kind of a bold move for them because it seemed, it still to this day is. A constructed playable card, a very powerful. We talked about how black has the most inefficient creatures. Like specifically, mm -hmm. black has the most inefficient creatures, and we're talking about a three mana, two three flyer death touch life. Well, they get the most inefficient creatures at common. You okay. know that should be true, but they're also starting. They to... get singer vampire, yeah. and that's a pretty. That I mean, that's an efficient yeah. creature. I mean, it's comparable to Sarah Angel at least. You know. It has the chance to get bigger and be... Even, I mean, even at Uncommon, though, there's some pretty bad uh, black creatures. Yeah. I guess in any color, there's bad Uncommon creatures. Mm -hmm. But I feel like black's always stuck out to me as, like, the card that's getting them. Yeah, and they should generally get the shaft when it comes to creatures and yeah. stuff. But that doesn't mean they can't ever have something good, either. No, you know? but... Vampire I don't know. Nighthawk, to me, I, I don't think I would have been as bold. Like, if Jake, and, if Jake had come to me with an idea that was Vampire Nighthawk, seeing Vampire Nighthawk, I would have been like, no way, dude. I don't even know if Jake would have been bold enough to even suggest Yeah, Flying Life, Blink, Death Touch, all <laughs> on a 2-3 for 3. For 3. Yeah. You would have at least been like a 1-1 one, one or something. You know what I mean? Like, that would have even, that would have felt yeah. good. Really good. And that would, you know what I mean? A 1-1 one, mm -hmm. one Flyer, Death Touch, Life Link, it still is doing plenty. I think it, it could like have been two, a 2-2. Two, 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 a 2-1. There were all sorts of... But 2-3 is, but... <laughs> In a standard environment where... In a relevant creature type, too, I forgot to add. In a standard environment where Lightning Bolt is around, you know, it's hard to say that that card is too good. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's true, but it was in M13 where there was no Lightning Bolt. It was in the Searing Spear, but that that's still... That's not as easy. Yeah, but it still hasn't proven itself to be better than anything. And Nighthawk was just such an insane card in M13 Limited. It's, it's probably one of the most powerful. Mm -hmm. Um... So there was that. Deprived. Do you remember this counter spell? That's, yeah. This one was interesting. The reason I liked Deprived, um, it actually saw a little bit of constructive play because uh, Zendikar and Worldwake had unique lands that mm -hmm. had Enter the Battlefield abilities like on them. Kalamar Depths. Depths probably being, being the, biggest the one. Yeah, the best example of seeing some constructive Kabira play. Kabira Crossroads wasn't... Ta uh, Teetering Peaks. Yeah, was Teetering Peaks was also big. Goblin Guide. That was... Teetering mm -hmm. Peaks Goblin Guide. I played the... Shit out of that deck. It was more than step links. Turn one goblin guy. Turn yeah. two goblin guy. Teary peaks. Yeah. Do eight damage to you by turn two. Have two creatures on the battlefield. Yeah, I remember that. Really obnoxiously strong. Yeah, it was. So red deck wins was probably one of the few decks that could be good competition. Maybe close to a coin flip against uh, Cobblade. That was like the best option just because red deck wins had the chance to go really over the top. I thought playing it. I had some success against Cobblade. So, uh, what are some other ones? Puncturing Light. Now, here's an example of one that would have been really good in like, any other, any other block, set. Yeah. But in this one, it's actually relatively weak. Yeah. It's one in a white, instant, destroy target, attack, near blocking creature with power three or less. So, like we said, you know, the, the biggest threats that you're going to play against are the big, fat 8-8, eight, 7-7s, eight, seven, 10-9s. Seven, mm -hmm. What's so, really funny also about this card is that white is typically the color that Destroys removes yeah the larger creatures that are so, attack that are attacking or blocking mm -hmm. specifically. Well, even just standing there, smite the monstrous will kill a creature with power four. Or, or even like Oblivion Ring, exiling yeah. uh, big creatures. So you could tell that they were conscious of that, I guess. 
And, and even the cheap ones that we've already talked about, like Vendetta, so you still get punished huge mm-hmm. for killing Eldrazi. And what was the other cheap Smite. one? Smite. We talked about I still get punished by the uh, Annihilator. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were they were being conscious of if it was cheap removal, then there was going to be a downside to killing Eldrazi mm-hmm. with it, which is cool. I'm glad that they were yeah. aware of that. Uh, Reality Spasm is pretty much just a, uh, what's the thing from Gate Crash? Gridlock, but yeah. you can untap as well. Not very good. Definitely, I don't know if it's that good. The untap either. never came up that much, I don't think. Spawning Breath was actually a really cool spell. This is one in a red instant. Deal one damage to a creature or player, and you get a little spawn token. Um, I really like this. This card but... saw constructed play with a Polymorph deck, because it was oh, kind nice. of, it was a cool idea. Mm-hmm. You know? It was a surprise, like, ping plus... End of turn, I yeah, have a creature. Yeah. And then I Polymorph it away next turn. Yeah, and even if you had... Uh, some other, like, Colony Garden or something. There was a way to, you could even use the spawn token to ramp to get a turn three polymorph. Mm-hmm. But, no, I guess that wouldn't work with your Colony Garden, but yeah, um, I remember... If you first turn Colony Garden. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, if yeah, that's a good point. So if you did it in that order. And then you had Scalding Tarn and Misty Rainforest, so... Yeah, so then you did Spawning Red turn two, turn three to polymorph, but... Mm-hmm. That was that's pretty specific, but that was a cool deck. I'm trying to think what you. Amrical? W- was it Amrical at that time? I, f- I feel like it wouldn't Protection be likely. From colored spells no, I mean it was that was good. likely right. I feel like there was some I other think it one was, too though. Because Oblivion Ring was the out to it, I think it was. Because nothing else was as powerful as Amrical when it came out. I mean, Polymorph is such a fringe deck anyway. Let's be honest. Yeah, like it, it was. It wasn't even putting up like yeah. term and stuff. It was pretty much like a deck that you're your creative brewer and your meta mm-hmm. wanted to try out and play. Mm-hmm. Which is cool. You need those guys. Yeah. So Induced Despair. This one's actually a good removal spell, albeit at a steep requirement. It's two colorless and a black instant. Has an additional cost to cast it. You have to reveal a creature card from your hand and then target creature gets minus X, minus X until a turn where it's the cards converted mana cost. So obviously this is good if you have Eldrazi since you're not going to be playing them until you know at least turn mm-hmm. six or seven or something. Um, it's nice to have be able to give minus 8, minus 8 for 3 mana. So, Induce Despair is a removal I like quite a bit. You're definitely going to want to make sure you have enough creatures to support it. But if you do, I think it's very good. Yeah. Last Kiss is an example of a, a removal spell that I think is actually not that good, once again. Like, decent. 2 in a black instant. It deals 2 damage to a creature or player, and you gain 2 life. Interesting. No, it to a creature. Oh, okay. Interesting to note, like, uh, Soren's Thirst would be an example of a card that this eventually sort of evolved into. Is Soren's Thirst a sorcery, or is it an instant? Um, it's an instant. So, Soren's Thirst was two black with the same ability. Yeah. So, it was just one cheaper, but one colored mana. More intensive. Um, but not very good in this uh, limited environment, I think. I mean, it's okay. It's definitely playable. It's just, don't be too excited about it, because yeah. you're going to have to deal with bigger threats. It is nice, though, and I actually played Soren's Thirst in a blue-black removal deck uh, out of sideboard for a little while. I really liked it because destroying creatures and gaining life, definitely good when you're, you know... Very good against the aggro. When you're the control player, yeah. definitely. Regress is one that I like a lot. Uh, this is a two and a blue return target permanent to its owner's hand. So, it's three mana, so it's not too cheap to do it. It's not like it's straight up on summon. So, it does require you to put some mana into it, but mm-hmm. it's because... Bouncing Eldrazi is such a big deal, especially if they've used Eldrazi spawn tokens to yeah, cast to the spell. Mm-hmm. So then they might not even be able to recast it because of Regress, at least for a couple more turns or a couple more mana drops. So Regress is definitely one I think is very good. Um, it also deals... Oh, that's what we forgot. There's one more mechanic, Totem Armor. Mm-hmm. So Totem Armor is not necessarily like a... What did I call it? I guess it, it's... I guess it is a mechanic. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty unusual one, but Totem Armor, um, so Totem Armor reads, if Enchanted Creature, it's there. It's all auras, and if Enchanted Creature would be destroyed, instead remove all damage from it and destroy this aura. So the reason it was cool, um, you could build multiple Totem Armors. This was sort of their way to see if, they wanted to make auras good. Mm-hmm. I feel like since auras became bad with probably the inclusion of equipment, um, they've really tried to find ways to push auras in a very positive way mm-hmm. without like making them obnoxious. It's a very tough balancing act. Obviously, the biggest risk of any aura spell is 
like the best argument I hear is why aren't you just playing a creature instead? That, that way you don't risk the chance of two for one in yourself. Because whether you've applied the aura or not, if they have the removal spell for it, you're losing two cards for mm -hmm. for one card. Well, and one of your cards is like strictly reliant on having another, another card. card. So there's really just two there's many things that are foundational downsides yeah. to like you auras. can't play it until you have the card out there, and then that is do, the only <laughs> card that you get to put it on too. So equipment has really way more reach, yeah. way more flexibility, versatility. Mm -hmm. It's just a better intuitively permanent, better yeah than enchantment than auras. But are. they've kept auras around. It's a very classic part of the game. So what is it, what do you think their reasoning is for that? Well, auras serve a purpose. You know they are things that you can put on people. They are things that you can put on lands and artifacts, you know. They're not I, as, I mean, I understand it. as equipment. I understand it flavorfully, but I, I see. Wait, but there's even equipment for lands, too, isn't there? With the, no, no fortify. fortify, I guess. So that was just... And it's called a fortification. Okay, so that was unique. You're right. Equipment is specifically for creatures, and auras can affect all permanent card types. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Well, there and is... even cards in graveyards. You can enchant an instant or sorcery or any card in your graveyard, Okay. Too. Well, then it's got some versatility. Yeah. Maybe it's more like, I, I want to see less creature auras, then. I yeah. would like to see more other applications of auras. It's just that auras are also, like, something that you can do at common insets for a way to buff creatures. Whereas, Without having to do yeah. equipment. Whereas even though there has been some common equipment. Yeah, which... but equipment at common, you have to make them pretty shitty, like yeah. Skyblinder staff and stuff like that. And Mirrodin's actually where they really screwed up on or dropped the ball on that, is because we saw cards like Bone Splitter, which was a common initially. But this was and... their first iteration they didn't of equipment. Know. They yeah. didn't know. They just didn't know. Um, and it's back in Modern Masters, yeah. yeah. Big surprise. Them. What? <laughs> well, it's a one-mana equipment. Equip creature gets plus two, plus zero, and then it equips for one. So obviously very good, very cheap, efficient. I mean, the next one we saw was like, what was the Zendikar one, the, the Cutlass? What was it? There was that plus oh. two, um, plus, Wait, two, plus, plus two, plus one. Um, it was like... Oh, yeah, Trusty Machete. Trusty Machete. So this one, I mean, look, it now it's one mana, two. And this card, and it was plus two, plus one, but still. This was obviously worse, but it still was very good. It was super strong. Yeah. Even at equipping two, it felt yeah. very, very good and limited. It was like an unholy strength. You're just constantly moving mm -hmm. around. So, Trusty Machete, very good. And, uh, I mean, anyway, Totem Armor was a cool idea because once you resolved it, at least if they killed the creature, it only got rid of the aura. Yeah, it was so you, like you acting as creature. a disenchant for their removal. Yeah. And it, it also worked against, like, combat damage and stuff like that. So you could yeah. have a chump blocker for one turn. So it was off your totem armor. It was versatile, but nobody was like going out of their way thinking it was insane. Oh, is this a new one? What yeah, is those are from Plane Chase. That one and Indric Umbra. Those are both from Plane Chase. That's kinda cool. I'd never seen these before. Whoa. What was that? I don't know, that was crazy. Um That was a weird noise. Yeah, it was. Uh so the totem cards in general, totem armor specifically, it's not just totem. It's all totem armor. Uh, Bear Umbra was a pretty good rare one, I think. Really Very powerful good rare effect, one. yeah. But what do you think of Totem Armor? I, I mean, this it's is good. Well, let's do the strategy. We'll show you the we'll, we'll show you the strategy. Yeah, it is. It's only good, I think. We'll show you R and Arlid, which was the you can do this strategy in in the Rise mm -hmm. of the Eldrazi Limited. And R and Arlid is a two and a green two two common creatures with power less than R and Arlid's power can't block it, and it gets plus one plus one for each or on the battlefield. So definitely a lot of stuff associated with this card yeah, if you have that. that common too. This guy was good. So if you got like three or four of these and you got like seven or eight um, totem armor, you got yourself a pretty awesome mm -hmm. little... Uh, and you don't even mind. need any Eldrazi they're, at that they're, point. Yeah. And That's an alternative yeah, to... Yeah, there are, there are several different alternative kind of non-Eldrazi decks you can do. The Defender one we talked yeah. about. But also the level, the level up. up. Blue-white level, level yeah. up is really... We did blue-black level up, which worked fine too, I thought. Yeah, it did work fine, but... Blue white is where the strategy lies because of the time of heroes. Of time and, of heroes yeah. yeah, so or an Arlid, definitely a good strategy in on its own if you get three or four of them. I guess it's a little more you have to sort of actively be working towards mm -hmm. it, but but even if if you're playing totem armors, then any creature is fine to play. You mm -hmm. know, so even if you don't have all of the or an Arlids you want, if you have all of the totem armor, then you're actually fine anyway with creatures. Yeah. You know? 
Totem Ar I mean, Totem Armor is still playable on anything. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of other good green creatures. Um, let's see. Stagger Shock we talked about. These are still the instants. Uh, Momentous Fall is kind of a cool, uh, rare one. But um, it looks like that's actually about it for the instant speed removal. Mm. Let's take a look at the sorcery speed removal. There's not actually as much as I thought there'd be for instant. Um, and like we said, since this was a standalone set in the block, it was therefore bigger. How many cards? Probably 200. 249 or thereabouts. I don't okay. know for sure. If maybe all of the colorless cards were just added. You know, all of the Eldrazi cards were added to the set, so it might have been like 265 or something like that. Okay, so we talked about Flame Slash. Forked Bolt is one mana sorcery, deals two damage, divided as you choose among one or two target creatures and players. This card's very good, and it's actually seen in Modern, too. Mm -hmm. um, Inquisition of Kozilek is actually a very funny card. This is a very this is another example of a card that's just shit in Rise <laughs> it's of the Eldrazi. terrible in its block, yeah. But now costs, like, a few bucks a piece, yeah. and it's like, only I an uncommon. It's at least four, maybe it's up to seven, but it's an expensive it's card. A, it's like three to five dollar uncommon yeah that and it's one black target player reveals his or her hand you choose a non-land card from it with converted mana cost three or less that player discards that card this is actually in some decks just seeing players straight up over thought sees um i was playing it over thought sees and legacy for sure so the whole point is in, in formats like you just said legacy what's like the highest converted mana cost spell you're even playing probably yeah. three so since most of the decks in Legacy are three mana or less, this essentially is Thought Seize without having to pay the two life. Mm -hmm. So, or is it deals two damage to you? I actually don't two know. Two life. Lost. Okay. Yeah. Inquisition was a um, really cool card. Yeah, it is. It's a really cool card. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. As far as the one drop take a card out of their hand effects go, I think I like this one and Thought Seize like at the same level, you know? Mm-hmm. I do like the consistency of Thoughtseize, but I really like Inquisition. True, and there are some things in Legacy that uh, Thoughtseize actually does hit that this doesn't, like mm -hmm. uh, Elspeth or yeah. something. Some decks are playing Elspeth, mm -hmm. I think. Or Jace, even. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jace, Mind Sculptor. No problem there. Uh, Oust is a cool spell. This mm -hmm. is an example of a really powerful removal spell for the Eldrazi strategy, I would think. Mm -hmm. It's an uncommon, one white sorcery, put target creature into its owner's library second from the top, its controller gains three life. Uh, this one saw definitely saw some play in Cobblade, uh, obviously because for the control deck, your opponent gaining three life doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. and, I, and putting it second from the top means they actually, you get a full free turn of not having to worry about it, plus then you're taking their draw away essentially mm -hmm. two turns later. So I felt like Oust was great. Did you ever really play it? You would have been the the I actually, playing those colors. Yeah, I think Oust is good. I just I don't think I played it as much as Condemn. I think Condemn was, it was also in, in that standard. Time, okay, and I was playing that more than this. I could see that. Oh God, Oust and Condemn together. That's yeah. so obnoxious. Mm -hmm. One way too much white. One white removal. I mean, they've actually. It feels like there were enough people complaining about that, because we had Sword Squad shares in the original Magic, but then it was Path to Exile during Conflux, and that one, I mean, it's not like it was broken, but it was very good. They keep trying to do one white mana removal spells, too, you know, in that same vein of Exile. And, and, like, we, and like I said, it doesn't feel too strong, it's just, it feels really, really strong. I think Condemn is probably the best, because it's restrictive. You know, they and have to be beneficial attacking. for your opponent. Yeah, and they gain life. Okay. And it puts it on the bottom, not in exile. So there's a chance they can shuffle to get it back. Mm -hmm. So I think Condemn, as far as white removal spells that want to like permanently remove something, that one's probably the best. And when was the last time we saw that? And it was, was a M11 or M10. I know it was 10th edition for sure, but I guess you're right. It was probably one of either M10 or M11. I think it was M11. I guess we can check. Yeah. M11, okay. And uh, do you think we're ever going to see it again? Maybe? I think it's I think it's a fine card. And it's and I think it could easily be brought back. It's not too obnoxious in control builds? Not in my opinion. Okay. I don't think so. But Maybe not with the now that we have X-proof. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, shrivel. Not that great. Not Kill very spawn. good. Yeah, so it's actually a decent sideboard card. Mm -hmm. One in a black, all creatures get minus one, minus one until one turn. Growth Spasm is a great sorcery. That was an amazing card. So this is two and a green. This saw some. Uh, this definitely saw some play, I think, in the Eldrazi ramp deck as maybe like a one or a two of. 
Um, oh, I think you played it as a three of. I can't even remember. That deck was mostly ramp. Yeah, so. it was lots of This ramp. is two and a green. Search your library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield. Tapped. Then shuffle your library. Put a zero one Eldrazi spawn creature token on the battlefield. So you get double ramp for three mana. Very good. Not the turn you play it, but the next turn you have mm -hmm. double ramp. You're at so. six mana on turn four. Parish of Thought. Cool spell. Obviously makes sense that they didn't want it. Uh, they didn't want to do Distress because of the Eldrazi, so they made it cost 3 mana. Parish of Thought is 3 mana sorcery. They reveal their hand. You choose a card from it, and then they shuffle it into their library. So a they, unique effect for I, black. I, I think they did shuffle into the library, because otherwise... I, I guess it would have been too beneficial for your opponent to get, like, a Kozilek and let them... If it was like put it in the graveyard, it they would, would let... just shuffle their whole graveyard. Yeah, it's not too, it's not too good because they do have that effect, but that ability is better in limited than it is in constructed. I think it was getting just, your spells recycled. Like I that. think it was anything to avoid the potential to reanimate like an Eldrazi. You know, they didn't want. I guess to artisan help. artisan would have been an interaction yeah. that was beneficial for them. Later on, much later on, but they could have exiled it. I think they do that in black from yeah, hand occasionally. But I think I think that this was. An interesting way to show, like, maybe an Eldrazi spell, you know, without action, because it is. Mm -hmm. um, and showing how the Eldrazi might interact with your mind instead of, like, exiling it or making you discard it. It's actually shuffled back into what you know, you just, you can't find it or access it. You know? Yeah, the picture is a, uh, a little Eldrazi, I'm assuming, spawn token, or maybe just some lesser Eldrazi. It looks like, well, it's definitely Kozilek because it has, like, the bifurcated arms. But why is the, he so small? Or no, it's Ulamog because of the plate skeleton. Oh, he's whatever. like, he's a spawn of Ulamog? Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, but he's, like, uh, got his finger on a woman's temple, and you can see some blood and sort of dark something Energies. going through her. Mm -hmm. She's got a cool tap on her arm. Uh, okay, let's look at Consuming Vapors. This is the one Jake talked about earlier. Four mana sorcery. It's a rare. Target player sacks a creature. Gain life equal to that creature's toughness. And it's got rebound. Pretty good. Ooh, okay. Trader's Instinct. Excellent sorcery to get in this first, format. Especially. First time for it. Yeah. Three and a red. Gain, and yeah, you're right. It came back in, um, what was it? Gatecrash again? Mm -hmm. or, no, no, no. No, it was a turn. And this is gain control of target creature until in turn. Untap that creature. And it gets plus two, plus zero in haste. Definitely good with Annihilate. Wrap in Flames, fairly weak one. This would have been a much better card, I think, in like a core set. You know, much stronger. Not better necessarily, but this is fair. This is a weak effect in, in this format. Yeah, it definitely Corpse is. Hatch is a great example of a very powerful um, removal spell in this in this format or any format, I would mm -hmm. think. Uh, three and two black sorcery, destroy target non black creature, put two zero one uh, colorless Eldrazi spawn creature tokens onto the battlefield. You know, it almost would have been cooler if it was destroy a uh, target colored creature or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So then it like was una unable to destroy the Eldrazi. Eldrazi, yeah. And then but they I might have even been able to justify it cheaper at that point. No, because like primarily your creatures are, are colored, you know. So then it would have been too narrow. It would have been only It's really... not even that narrow. It's like actually very, very open. Like you can use it like over the entire board. And but I, I guess I was hitting the Eldrazi. Yeah, I was just thinking specifically. If to they this wanted format. to do that, they they should have done like target non Eldrazi creature. You know. Okay, I would have been okay with that yeah. too. And that would have actually made opened more it up for commander, and it would have yeah. opened it up more for commander. Yeah, exactly. Since Eye Blight's ending is playable oh, as well sure, as the yeah. what's the destroy target non spirit one? Ren Flesh. Yeah, those two are like. A couple of my favorite. And Chill to the Bone is really good, too. Destroy that... target non-snow creature. Oh. It's like... <laughs> that one's four mana? Instant? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked about it. We actually got an Explosive Revelation. I needed to read this card. It's three and two red. Uncommon. Choose a creature or player. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-land card. Deals damage equal to that card. It's going to mana cost to that creature or player. And then you put the non-land card into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. I guess the cool aspect of it is at least you're netting a non-land card. Mm -hmm. Um, I can it's see... It's a little risky. Yeah, chaotic. it's it's random. Yeah. But I actually think this is playable if you're in red. I've liked... I've played it and liked it. It's a little expensive, but I feel like this... Just because it nets you a card and it has the potential to either kill a player or remove a creature. Mm -hmm. Good enough. At least guarantee you kill an X1. Yeah, right? yeah. So, uh... Fissure... Unless you're running zero mana spells. Fissure Vent... 
three and two red destroy target artifact and or destroy target non basic clan. Hmm. That actually feels like a really good commander card. I'm surprised I, I don't like have that in commander, but it's it's actually not as good as you would think. Even though it's uh, two for one most of the time, yeah. it's just you want to do more. It's like it's still a common. There's still so much out there that's better. Yeah, that's probably true. World at War, the rare we talked about earlier. Essence Feed is kind of a card that I think is a little too pricey to be very good. It's five and a black sorcery. Target player loses three life. You gain three life and put three zero one colorless Eldrazi spawn creature tokens onto the battlefield. They have sacked this creature. Add one to your mana pool. A little too expensive. You see. I mean, it is yeah. a black. It is a black ability, but just not good enough. I mean, it's good enough to play. You just, it's not your ideal one. At six mana, you kind of want more. Mm -hmm. It does give you three, three chomp blockers. Things. Yeah. Three life. Three life lost and three creatures. So then three ramp, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's it's playable. Yeah. Just don't be too excited about it because yeah. it costs six mana. It is expensive. Um, let's see some non mythic, non rare stuff. A lot of rares. Skittering Invasion. Okay, that one's uncommon. Seven mana. This one's hard to play. Put five colorless Eldrazi spawn creature tokens on the battlefield. I feel like this card doesn't do enough for seven mana, don't you? I feel the same way, yeah. It's expensive. And even if you're, I see the point of like, if you already have a couple Eldrazi, it, it gives you more ramp. Mm -hmm. But it's, in my opinion, a little too expensive. It's expensive for a little payoff. It has a crazy zero, picture, one. though. It has a very weird, unusual picture. Um, I do want to do the Rise of the Eldrazi draft pretty soon here. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to talk about um, a kind of a wrap-up of Return of Ravnica block. So we've been playing it for months. You've seen Jake and I streaming it for how long now? Mm -hmm. um, we, we had some fun with it. Sometimes it's difficult to remember the fun times because I do feel like the limited environment changed later in its life in the last like month or so it's really kind of gotten cutthroat in a weird way you you, you have to be what we've kind of learned is the dragon's maze pack doesn't decide your deck as much as what's open in the second pack that's kind of the issue so you don't really learn as much information you don't learn anything you I mean, learn nothing yeah. out of the first pack which is a big limited issue before, I guess it wasn't a problem. Well, both Return to Ravnica and Gate Crash on their own were great. They were a lot of fun, and I don't think we had any complaints of mm -hmm. that. I don't remember complaining about that. No, I always thought it was fun. It was five different guilds for eight people, which meant that, like, most of the time, only three of them were doubled up on. So, you know, there was plenty of cards to go around for everybody for every guild. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue with the Dragon's Maze packs, you had, now we have you had all ten, ten guilds. guilds. Yeah. into a small set and then how many cards even had the mechanics yeah. that was our biggest gripe that's my biggest gripe it's yeah, like mine you too. didn't even push the mechanics in this set and then you gave you i have, think two cards or one card with i the, feel like the other thing is like i actually think the clue stones were a big miss i, think I don't know that, why though i mean i think that that they're, they were playable and they were they are still played they're still played yeah in, they in are it. i think feel like they would have been better off with some other Ability. cycle of like half the cards you know like five cards doing something different you like know? generating three mana instead or something something or... else i don't even know like i really don't know but i don't like how the clue stones affect they were very the sim they were very simplistic and they were like a common version of key rune oh i see what you're saying because they were common dragon's maze packs and also because it's a small set You'd run in these like five uh, clue stone packs, mm -hmm. and it was obnoxious. It was ugly to look at. And you they, didn't. They don't give you a sense of what's open. Yeah, either. there's no knowledge. Yeah, so you can no, see like a nothing, second to last pick Demir clue stone. It does not mean Demir yeah. is open. There's nothing to be gained from it. Um, if they had been, if all of that cycle had been dropped and they did one card that was like the mana fixer or two or three different artifacts that were mana fixers but fixed in different ways. Yeah. So, that would have been, I think, a lot better to that set than what they ended up doing with the Clue Stones. You know, I like the Clue Stones, how they want them to work, but I don't like that they step on the toes of key runes. And they don't indicate what direction yeah. you're drafting. So that is a big issue. And uh, ultimately, like we said, it really cost in the full block. But, I mean, at the beginning of the full block, it was fine. I guess but it was harder to notice. I think or the thing is the strategy the beginning, did change. the beginning, people were probably going, I want to be built. this three-color yeah. combination, no, yeah. and like I can pick these two cards up, and I'll start forcing this out of this pack. 
and they actually played into that strategy. Mm-hmm. Well, then people were like, start drafting to the gate crash, or that uh, start drafting for gate crash, or like to the gate crash pack. No, it's absolutely right, and that was and then, like that was the pro tour strategy too. Was yeah. draft towards uh, the gate crash uh, guild that you want to be, and then if it wasn't open, you still had Return of Ravnica to sort of bounce back and clean up on. Mm-hmm. But like we've tried multiple times to draft to the Return of Ravnica pack, and it just does not work it out. It falls apart. You yeah. can miss. You can miss so hard and not even realize it until you get to the return to Ravnica pack. Because it's not like you're getting any sort of indication during the gate crash pack, mm-hmm. and you didn't get any indication during your uh, dragon's face pack. pack. Yeah. So it's really like just blind going into return to Ravnica, mm-hmm. which which kind of sucked because arguably return to Ravnica was the best of the three. I almost. I, I think I had. I mean, I liked Extort the most from Gatecrash, but I want to say I liked Return to Ravnica, uh, Triple Return to Ravnica the, more than Gatecrash. I'm trying I think. to decide. I really liked Evolve. You know, I love the Simic in Gatecrash. I really liked that. Yeah, it's almost like the mechanics in Gatecrash were better, but for some reason, like, the cards, the, the way they designed the cards in Re- just Return to Ravnica were better. I don't know. I think Return to, Rav- Re- Return to Ravnica feels more guild like almost it like actually evokes the feel of the original ravnica setting and stuff i could see that and then gate yeah. crash was a really good environment but not necessarily a evocative ba- a, of like of the original ravnica yeah. that's a good point i could see that some of the early some of the original uh, ravnica uh, mechanics were very strange too like we've mm-hmm. talked about haunt on here before and how mm-hmm. that was a miss only in that it was like really so convoluted and they tried to they tried to do it on both on like non creature creatures or both all types of permanents yeah. basically and spells our spells yeah yeah, yeah. Meant. everything they yeah. tried to do it on and it just didn't work out for them because of that i don't i don't know why you would have haunt on a spell and it doesn't make sense when you say it this spell has haunt what why would a spell haunt you um Let's keep talking about it. I'm just going to join the queue now, and we may have to pause it if it's going to take too long, but we can still... Let's keep talking about Return around Ravnica Block, because... Oh, it's seven people. Oh, there. my God, perfect. Well, we joined just in time. Wow. I logged on the perfect time. All right, well, we're going to start it then. Hey, Rage and Uh, Looks like we have a little bit of a issue here. Um, graphically, this happens occasionally. But oh, uh, l- let's look at... Uh, where is card? All right. So our rare is Rage Nimbus, which is a powerful defender. I don't know if I'm opposed to first picking it, but a Rapacious one is also very good. A uh, very good one. Nest Invader. Nest Invader, very good. Boar Umbra. Mm-hmm. There's a lot. Hand of Immacle is the weakest one, so I don't think we want to take that. Um, I, I really think it's either Rapacious one or Rage Nimbus. I guess Rage Nimbus is the most interesting, and it actually has the highest upside, being as it blocks flyers. And it forces attacks on weaker creatures. It won't kill anyone. Rapacious one might. It's true. Um, but this also possibly lets us go down a defender theme. Okay. I'm okay with Game it. with trying um, it. Yeah. It's rare. We don't see it much. Yeah. There's nothing that's phenomenally defender. strong here. Boar Umber is a strong card, but I don't feel as comfortable yeah, picking if, that over the sort of rare If you want to go, like, defender theme... We can try it. Yeah, I'm, can, I'm, like, I don't even think I've done it, so... Pack. Yeah, let's, let's uh, think about it. Um, all right, this pack has Brood Birthing. Um, that's probably not the first pick. P- Pawn Fulamog is a very good card. Uh, mm-hmm. This one's three mana, two two Vampire Shaman. When it or another non-token creature control dies, you get a you get a spawn token. Pretty good. Seagate Oracle Foil is actually a really cool one too. Uh, this one lets it's a three mana one three, but it lets you you know look at the top two and put one in your hand. It's a pretty good blue spell. Mm-hmm. I like Praise Vengeance too. Um, um, so I'm if thinking, you want to go defender path, though, maybe it, Wave Watch. I mean, this one's not a defender, but there isn't a defender in this package. No, there. no. But I like the pawn. I don't mind him. Um, what uh, white is more of the? Uh, I would say green and white are like your primary kind of colors to go into if you want to be defender too, because green has overgrown battlement. Oh, and I see. That's the one yeah. you want to get for your Eldrazi. That's a good point. So green and white, but so there's... I would go wild heart invoker if I was gonna pick a green card. Well, it's the green card. Yeah, it's a pretty efficient creature. I guess I'm okay with that. Not a very exciting second pick, but 
we were kind of going a little bit late there. All right, Spawning Breath's actually a pretty good one since it's both a ramp spell and a removal spell. Yeah, not an amazing one by any means, but what's the, how's this one work again? Um, it's a little too narrow for the Soul Surge Elemental. You said it was green and white were our defenders. Uh, there is a Hand of Emrakul in here. Icarl Outrider, too. It's uh, a level up creature. It's a 2 mana, 1 2. Level up for 4. Level 1, it becomes a 2 6 Vig. That's pretty good. We could stick. Why don't we stick with the, the spawning breath for now? Okay. Um, Cadaver Imp's also very good. Mm -hmm. I really like this card a lot. Or Stomper Cup. I like the green like Stomp deck too. Could work. Does it? It's five three Trampler. I kind of like the spawning breath just because ramp is going to be essential if we're drafting Eldrazi, which I mean you really want to do. Mm -hmm. Any deck can run the Eldrazi. That's the best point, even if you're a defender, especially if we're the uh, overgrown battlement one. Um, all right, well, there's a Skittering Invasion in here, but we just talked about how it's a little bit unexciting. Devastating Summons. Goblin Arsonist is okay, too. Uh, Devastating Summons is a rare, though, and we're probably red, so I think I, I feel comfortable taking that. I mean, it's a finisher. Yeah. Devastating Summons is a one-mana sorcery. Uh, as an additional cost, sack X lands, and then you put two X red elemental creature tokens on the battlefield. It's pretty strong. Not the greatest third pick, but... Um, Certainly powerful enough. All right, we could take an Eldrazi Temple too. Yeah, we'll just get that guy's deck. Yeah, ideally, Totem Guide Heart Beast is pretty cool since it's a five mana lets you get another card in your hand if we pick up any, mm -hmm. um, if we pick up any auras, any totem armors. I guess I'm, I'm comfortable with the the Temple. I'd just take Still it. Still early enough, we could see some hands or something. It's only pack one. Yeah. Uh, there there is Ogre Sentry. Uh, looks like green's getting cut. Maybe blue's open. It maybe it's still too early to tell. But we can take the sentry. Stick to red for now. Um, okay. Oh, well, have... there's a stalwart shield bearers. All right. So we can maybe go a little bit deeper red if we're hoping to see vent sentinel or overgrown battlement. Um, definitely not any super exciting green picks in here. So I guess I'm comfortable with stalwart shield bearers. Maybe. See if we can pick up some more defenders. I'd like. Then It'd be cool. All right. Well, we got the hand now, and I'd say with the temple, spawning breath, um, we can comfortably take hand now. Potentially get some more ram for it later. Okay. All right. We'll take them both. Spawning breath. Uh, we. Oh, I guess we could take. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's get some more ramp. I'm. I'm cool with that. Not the best removal, but it is a two mana ramp. A one-time ramp only, but it also produces a chumper. Like it's one damage. To it's them pretty versatile. It yeah, I mean it does a lot of things. Yeah, deceptively good. Not the best spell ever made, but it's good enough. It's playable. Yeah. So I mean, we we ideally we can sort of go a couple different directions still. Um, we're we're definitely trying to signal that red. We want red. Oh, well, it looks like it, it does look like that's where, thing, okay. We we can. Possibly make this work. I really wish What's this guy do? It's just pain oh, when yeah. he comes out. He's a little too expensive, I yeah. think. Let's, I guess we can take the, the brood breathing. Really. You wish we'd gotten what? The rapacious one now. Oh, I see. Okay. Instead of the rage nimbus. Yeah. He's still fine though on his own. He can eat little dudes, and he works well with this guy. Mm -hmm. So we may still be red, white. I still like rage nimbus. I think he's good. Rapacious one is very good too, and I have played that card, just generating a bunch of. Eldrazi's oh, Bonds is very good. Yeah. But it is 6 mana, and Rage Nimbus is cheap. Take the swipe, I think. Unless you think Destiny is worth it, I guess. I don't think Fissure Bend is worth playing. Um, well, I just want to cut red. I want to okay. signal more that red's not open. That's really the only reason I'm taking it. I want to make sure we get all the red cards. Okay. It's kind of refreshing to be in an environment where signaling probably does something. <laughs> yeah. Towards the end of Return of Ravnica, I didn't feel like it anymore. All right, we can take another one. Yeah, let's just be a spawn deck. Spawn and All right, end. so it looks like we the white idea is going to work out. Take um, the heart piece, we could, we could take the removal, I guess, in case we get any auras. There are red auras too, right? Or No, but... Oh, there is only white? Yeah, but Hyena Umbra is a really, Umbra is a really good one. We're going to let them have Night Days. I don't know what better way to signal that we don't need to be in black. So it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do make green work, uh, likely, but 
we can make uh, red white work. Hedron matrix uh, four mana equipment gets plus X plus X where it's, it's converted mana cost. It's not bad. Um, heat ray I think is probably what the pick flame is. Slash. I guess flame slash is even more efficient, so we can take that. Heat ray is very good, but heat I really good like too. There's the hyena umbra and there's an oust in here as well, both of which are good. We're not sure what our second color is. For yeah, sure. let's like take the flame thing. slash just because it's cheap removal. Yeah, it's pretty cheap removal. Yeah. Hedron matrix is good too. I feel like decent. Probably not great for us. No, not necessarily where we're at. So, um, I still I think devastating summons is a pretty satisfactory game ender late game. You With know. five lands, it's two five fives. Yeah, it can take the game over. Mm -hmm. It was funny how badly we got juked. You remember? It was the we did all this stuff. We even had the answer. Yes. We like the, uh, it was had, so terrible. And he had to dure for server. That hurt. Kabir Vindicator is a very good card. This is a four mana yeah. two four with level up, two I'm, and a white, and other creatures control get plus some. I really spawn. want that because of the yeah. amount of spawn we can generate. There's also deck. Smite, which is very good. Caravan Escort as well. But um, we can take the Vindicator. I agree. That's a good point. With the spawn tokens, they become yeah, actual double beaters. Double birthing and two spawning breath. Yeah. So well, it's uh, and it, it appears that white is open. Yeah. If white's open, we almost want to take the smite and hope to wheel it, but the Kabir Vindicator is not coming back around, and that yeah. card is amazing. It's probably not. You're right. Okay. A second one, I would take it. Uh, Emrakul's Hatcher is good. You can take too. a second Vindicator. Emrakul's Hatcher generates three spawn tokens. We may need it for the Brood Birthings, sadly. You know, if we if we well, want to make Brood Birthings. Brood Birthings were going late, too. Okay. I kind of want the Vindicator. Like, doubling up on Vindicator is crazy. Okay. It does take a little while to get him online, but he's pretty powerful. I agree with that. All right, there's Souls Attendant. There's also a Curel Outrider. I like Attendant for our deck, actually. Yeah, Attendant actually works. Um, Souls Attendant is basically just a, uh, a, a May ability attached to a Soul Warden. Mm. Um, so I guess we could take the Souls Attendant. What does this turn into? I guess he, Fourth, he uh, turns into ten. a 2-6. That's kind of relevant. Yeah. Do I like Souls Attendant more, though? I don't actually know. Icarill Outrider it takes a lot of mana to get going, too. I guess we can try the Attendant out. It might be a good plan with our, our sort of, uh, um, Spawning Breath plan, our token generation plan. Still good with Vindicator. We'll try it out. Trader's Instinct, I think we want. There's Vincent, also Vincent. No. Oh, we can take him now. Um, we currently only have... We have Rage Nimbus, Stalwart, Shield Bears. Ogre Sentry. And Sentry. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have three. Hmm. Why don't we go for it? We've never done it before. Yeah. I'm not opposed to it. It's still good with Attendant. Yeah. Still good with Rage Nimbus, actually. I do like Trader's Instinct a ton, but let's let's try this Vincent. Sentinel we'll plan out if we can. All right, we can take Pathraiser. We probably have enough ramp to make it work. It might be difficult, but we still have opportunities to get more ramp. Pathraiser is kind of one of my least favorite ones just because it's so damn expensive. 11 yeah. mana. I'd much rather have like the the 10 mana one mm -hmm. that lets you res a creature or whatever. So. Or uh, just Ulamog's Crusher. I'd much rather have Ulamog's Crusher. Yeah, Pathraiser is pretty pricey. I could see having a hard time playing him. I mean, he's hard to play in Commander. You know? Mm-hmm. But we do have Eldrazi Temple, and we have Spawning Breaths and Brood Birthings, and yeah, we probably actually currently we can't make Brood Birthing work. We're gonna need more. Uh, we can take Puncturing Light here. Yeah, it is a removal spell after all. How about Angel Heart Vile Turd? Yeah, that card is a turd. Uh, Raidbound Bard Bardment's an interesting one because it works with Eldrazi Spawn and actually kind of is like a little buff spell for them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. So currently only have two Eldrazi, and neither of which I'm really that happy with, but that's okay. Uh, I like the Vindicators, and so far our game plan, we at least have ways that we can win. I like the whole summons idea, the whole Vent Sentinel defender idea, potentially, until we get into the late game. What better way to get to 11 mana than have a bunch of batty defenders? <laughs> Uh, we can take the Escort here. There's also McKinney Griffin. What's Siege Runner do? Destroy the defenders. Yeah, it's good against us. Um, what's the Escort do, though? He's pretty cheap. We, we probably want him. And he's, he's cheap to level. I like him. Let's try him out. He's a decent little mana sink. And a 5-5 five, five first strike's nothing to scoff at. So mm -hmm. if you can get to that point. 
it will reward us for having them getting flooded. Um, so this set does have a lot of mana sinks in it, but we pretty comfortably played 17 mana in the last draft we did, I think. We didn't really get mana screwed at all. Mm -mm. I think we got flooded more often. I think so, too. So 17 is usually the number you're at if you have some uh, ramp elements, which we do. But um, we can take the Invasion here. We can also take the Outrider. We can take the Oust, I guess. That that could be pretty good. Mm -hmm. Oust at least takes care of uh, Eldrazi for a couple turns. Yeah. Are you okay with that? You think it's decent? I can see the Matrix being decent, but just not with us. Yeah. We're not going to benefit much from that. Outrider's okay, too. But let's let's take a little... It's not hard removal, but it is removal. Buys us turns, and we're defending Potentially, that. yeah, and potentially buys us more than you'd think with the uh, the fact that they might be using spawn tokens to generate the creature. So, Oust, I think, can be pretty good. Now we got the Smite back. It's pretty wow. awesome. I and think we're going to take it. The Spawning Breath's good, too, but Smite's more powerful. Yeah, I agree. I think, especially with our Defender plan. Uh, Luminous Wake. Fine. I could, white. Yeah, I could see it uh, possibly being playable, but... It, like, might prevents be. A, a creature with power less than four from attacking. Mm -hmm. You know. Outrider. Definitely a good indication that white's open. So, red-white seems like an unusual color combination to me. I'm not sure if I've ever done it before. All right. But four drop on color. Lizard's playable. But you have that contaminated ground, sir. All right, so moving into the last pack, I would like to see a few more Eldrazi spawn generators. A couple more uh, defenders would be nice. I would really like another Vincent, and it would be nice to go a little bit deeper into that strategy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Another Sentry or another Stalwart Shield Bearer, too, would be nice. Yep. Oh, oh, wow. Well, we opened Emrakul. I think we have to take him. I'm actually... That's a pretty... major bummer, because there's other good cards in this well, I'm not going to complain about opening Numerical. Dreamstone Hedron would be really nice to get. I'm kind of curious what he's worth. I guess he's worth about seven. Well, he's not worth as much as I thought, but he's certainly worth enough for me to take him. Um, what else did you say was good in here? I guess. Brimstone Mage is good. Yeah, Brimstone Mage is good. But Knight of Cliffhaven is very good. Mm -hmm. We're just going to take Emrakul. Mm -hmm. I can't help myself. I don't know if we're going to be able to play him. Most likely not. It's pretty Drag tough to get to 15. Speaker. We don't have enough ramp. Um, yeah, we can take Tree Speaker. It doesn't seem like we're <laughs> likely to play it. We can do the raid. Ready. We can do the raid bombardment. We can do Coraline Slinger. Let's take that. And actually, okay. it's playable. It's not uh, that great, especially in this format, but it's playable. Uh, Soulbound Soul Guardians. We can take Fort him. Bolt. Fork Bolt's good removal. But I like Soulbound Guardian. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's try and make Defender work if we can. I mean, I'm, I was trying to gun for it, but if we see another Vincent, I'd be really happy. Tempira Vindicator 3. Yep, or... we can take that. I'll wear another Soulbound Guardian. I think we probably want the Vindicator. Yeah, it's... I really like Vindicator. Yeah, and he, he can do a lot of work. He's yeah. a He turns into a blessing quick, so we can take three of them is pretty strong. We can play him over the Lizard. Uh, we're currently at 26 playables. I don't even think Brood Birthing at this point is playable. Um, the yeah, rest looks decent, though. Too. Probably have to cut the Immerkul. Uh Probably have to cut the Pathraiser. I might leave the hand in. Okay. Because um, we can get to 9, potentially. But I guess I'm, I'm more willing to cut that. Actually, with the Temple. We can get to 8. A yeah. little easier, but... Yeah, sadly. Um, not going to be able to play Immerkul even with Eldrazi Temple. I guess we could really make our deck... Land intensive, more land intensive. Try and really force that Emrakul out. Unless but we need to. If we can get the ramp for it, I would do it. I just I don't see it coming. Griffin? Yeah, Griffin looks like he's playable. He's a nice blocker, or else another puncturing light. But I guess we we could use some more creatures. We already have so many four drops. It's kind of my issue, and the I Vindicators know. are clearly better. Let's just take the light, just in case. Okay. Uh, I can take another Escort. We can uh, take another Devastating, devastating Summons. We're not going to play two. Yeah, I don't think so Traitor's either. Instinct. Let's take the Instinct now. Yeah. We could also take another Spawning Breath. It makes us closer to being able to turn on Brood Birthing, but eh, I'm still, I guess, I'm uncomfortable. Why? Um, why? why would you it's only anything? three. It's like not enough. I thought know? Brood Birthing gave you four if you got it. But you already have to have a Spawning. You already have to oh, have no. uh, an Eldrazi token. You have to already yeah. control an Eldrazi yeah. spawn. It'd be it too difficult. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do the instinct. Okay. That's really strong. 
Especially with our defender theme, too. Yeah. So we're kind of a low creature count deck, which is a little bit awkward with the Vindicators, but they're just they they get fat on their own too. It's not like four eights anything to scoff at. And I like I do like having a, a blessing effect potential. Uh, oh, got that Vincent. Oh, that's that's some yeah, cool moves. Sadly, in the same pack with Warmonder's Chariot. Yeah, which would have been cool. I'm 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 actually a little bit cool with Vincent, just because I really wanted to try that out. Um, I guess Lizard maybe in case we need it. Doubt it. We could be a fatty deck. I mean, we're not doing the Heart Beast, you know? Don, or Don Glare Invoker. Yeah. Very good. This guy is we good. We have no three drops. He's actually a really... This, this card's just really strong in general because yeah. that uh, ability um, at a certain point can actually just take the game over. Mm -hmm. I've seen people just angry seed with Don Glare Invoker. Yeah. If they don't have the outs for it, you can just leave the mana. If you have a better board state, it can eight be... Eight mana is, like... Doable. Once this, you get to yeah. eight, and if you already have control, this for sideboard. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's good against Totem Armor. Um, we need to make three cuts. We might not even do Temple and Hand. I, I think we might even be able to get out of this plan. And then we only need to cut a couple more. Lion Slayer. Just in case, against the aggro deck. We can probably take them out of main deck. Mm -hmm. And maybe even take the, the Punching Lights out. Not the most exciting deck I've ever played, but... It's playable. How yeah. many defenders did we end up getting? I'm actually One, two, surprised at how few three, we got. Three, four, five, six. Good. Six is decent. Okay. Yeah, let's take them. This is 23. I'm pretty comfortable with this. Take the Siege Runner, I guess. Probably don't need to main deck him. I don't even mind playing a lot of four drops, I guess. Pretty birthing. Yeah, unfortunately not enough token generation. Um, we kind of waxed and waned between the defender deck and that. I feel like we didn't pass too many good defenders, though. The only choice we really made was picking something over uh, the second Soulbound Guardian. I kind of forget what it was, but... It was something really important, I think. It was something good. Definitely. We can still play the Spawning Breaths. Since we have so many 4-drops, I can see that being a reasonable decision. A lot of indicators, soul bone guardians, and this is 23. Curves a little bit awkward, but not for this format. It's not that bad. We almost don't have enough top end. Is kind of my issue. You know. Yeah, but Kabir of indicator is a good game plan. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so our game plan is really, but we have the defender theme too, so it becomes a lot less um, less Does good. Does indicator get vigilance after it gets to level two? No, nope. just a buff. Hmm. Okay, so our win cons are really devastating summons, leveling up vindicators. Yeah, I think it's the lizards that are kind of awkward. Yeah. I don't really mind brood birthing, to we, be perfectly honest. I was kind of thinking maybe we try and make the temple work with like a hand. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay. And like actually give us a late game plan. Not that he's insane. I just like having I like having that luxury, especially if we have a temple already. It's not like we're okay. a super color intensive deck, you know. So let's try and make our Eldrazi work. And even though this one is probably the worst one, or is the worst one, I'm probably more comfortable than doing Pathraiser. So our really our only ramp is two spawning breaths and temple, but that's that's probably comfortable enough to me where I think we could potentially get to nine. You have to also keep in mind this is a slower format, like we said, so. Uh, can't believe we opened Emrakul. We saw Emrakul twice in two. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Since he's mythic and all. Um, all right, well, um, this is 23, so with the temple, let's check out the color. I mean, we could do cheaper creatures, too, like the Siege Runner to work with the... We could, we could also try the play cheaper creatures. I might be okay with that. And like, let's, let's separate out some of the removal we've got. Like maybe, well, maybe we don't want the spawning breath then. You know what I mean? Like what's the spawning breath really doing in this deck? One damage or something? Mm -hmm. Like we'd sideboard into that, you know what I mean? 
I'd almost rather just do creatures. Just do like the Siege Runner, another Lizard, and like a Slinger maybe. Okay. You know? Yeah. So we have more early game. We have 18 creatures. It makes the Vindicators feel more useful. Even this is kind of sad, like just a zero one, but two three with Vindicator. And it lets you get it lets you get to the point of getting the double level up. Mm -hmm. We're a slow deck, I'll say that. But actually, I really like Rage Nimbus with Vindicator. I feel like that's good. I do too. I actually really like Rage Nimbus with Smite. It's really good with Soulbound Guardians too. Mm -hmm. So I'm not feeling too bad about that first pick Rage Nimbus. I think it worked out decently. This looks like a pretty decent deck. It's funny how all our removal is, like, cheap. We yeah. really don't have that much beyond it. But that's okay. So, I'm going to run it like this. No temple necessary. I guess we'll do slightly more white. I agree. Especially with the Vindicators. Um, so, if you want to watch this, uh, the games that we're going to play, go to seemsgoodmagic.com. Um, follow me on Twitter, at seemsgoodmagic. Um, I'm still saying when we're live streaming. And I remind people, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, email me, mortarpod at seemsgoodmagic.com. Uh, if you listen to this podcast and you've not already subscribed to me on YouTube, I'd really appreciate it if you would do that. It just gives me a better indicator of uh, you know who's listening to the podcast and if, if people are uh, more aware of my YouTube site in general. So uh, just look up uh, Seems Good Magic Vids at YouTube. And uh, that's V-I-D-S. Seems good magic, V-I-D-S, vids. Um, okay, I think that's going to be it for this podcast. I uh, hope you learned something about Rise from the of the Eldrazi. This is kind of an unusual deck since we didn't end up playing him. It's kind of funny, too, since we ended up with the best Eldrazi and we couldn't even afford to play it. I think it's actually a card that you don't usually get to play unless it's the unless you, first yeah. thing you draft. And, and you really draft after yeah. it, yeah. You get those battlements. You get, like, three battlements Birthings or something. Birthings and spawning breath. Everything that ramps and gives We were spawn. close. Yeah. We were close. Just not quite there. Um, this deck doesn't look bad, though. I'm excited to try out Vincent. I hope he pans out all right. Or the Vindicators of the Summons. So we've got some mana sinks. Um, all right, I'll see you guys later.